Hello and welcome to another video this week. Welcome, happy holidays to everybody and looking forward to today. We're gonna to talk all about the A10 Mini Pro today and we're gonna kind of take it back to the basics and go from scratch talking about from the ground up how to use the A10 Mini Pro ISO, which I have in front of me here on the desk in my nice little lovely stand, which reminds me we need to first, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna first do the giveaway from yesterday's stream and then talk about today's giveaway. Uh, but before we do that, I want to, I want to give a quick rundown of how this show is going to work today. So the idea with the videos this week during what I've been calling stream week is trying out a different live, live streaming device every day and focusing on ones that are primarily complete kits where you can go live from the device on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, or whatever it is. And um, I want to show you what it's like to really use these devices. So in order to do that, what I've been doing is doing these live. And we actually go through the process of setting them up, going through all the features on the device. And we also often run into issues and see how we recover from problems and see what it takes to actually troubleshoot these things live. Because it turns out there are often things that you can very easily cover up in product demos with editing that um, I cannot cover up live. And that's what I want to show you. So we are going back to the A10 Mini Pro because that is something I actually haven't talked about in a while. I've been focusing on um, the sort of larger, larger kits. I've been talking about my studio setup where there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of gear here. But for now, we're going to focus just on what you can do with a single A10 Mini Pro. It is the ISO model, which talk, which is the uh, lets you record all the cameras at once. But we'll get into that later. So the way we're gonna uh, talk about the device, we're gonna go through a bunch of different categories of features of the device. So I'm gonna talk about kind of what what are the physical characteristics of the device, what what can you plug in, and uh, how do you get inputs and outputs into the device, audio inputs, video inputs what other things you need in order to use the device. So uh, some of them that we've been looking at have monitors built in. This one does not, for example. Um, and then we'll take a look at the actual control of the, of the device about you know, what all these buttons do, as well as other ways to control the device. We'll talk about the graphics capabilities of what you can do with just the device or uh, how you can bring in other graphics as well. And um, we'll go over any of the sort of layouts and transitions that are in, in here as well. We will do a stream from the device also. So I will, uh, show the, I will show the actual stream coming off of the ATEM on this stream and we'll look at what it takes to set that up and how that works. So, all right, that's the sort of summary of what to expect in this stream. Um, I will later add timestamps to everything so you can jump around after this is done. But we are doing this live, so there's no timestamps yet, of course. Okay. Um, before we get started with this, I want to first, um, let's, uh, I do want to remind you, if you have a question uh, at any point during the stream, totally fine, drop it in the channel, start the message with the letter Q, and that'll filter it into my chat here so I can uh, see it, find it better throughout the rest of the conversations. But let's see what we've got here in the chat. First of all, joining us uh, a lot of, I see a lot of regulars are here, which is awesome. And uh, we've got, um, yeah, apologies to all of the, the Europeans for doing this stream on Christmas Eve. But if you are joining us from there, then welcome and wonderful. I see some, oh, you know what I realized is Hawaii is not visible on my on my map. I apologize for that. Apparently, I cropped the map such that Hawaii is not visible. But thanks for joining from Maui. Any other uh, questions here before we before we get started? Uh, anybody know if the Yola box stand that was in the preview, does it have the hot shoe mounts? It does. Um, do I have it here? I don't have it. I don't have it here. Um, but it matches 
very, very close matches the ATEM mini stand. So this ATEM mini stand is the one that I designed and it is, uh, it's got, you can see I've got this microphone mounted on this um, cold shoe mount here. And the Yola box stand is meant to be extremely similar to this. So it has a lot of similar features and it has, um, it does not have the top bar because you don't need to put a monitor on top, which is one of the first things I always wanted to do with the ATEM mini was add a monitor, of course. Um, with the Yola box, it, it is a monitor, so it, but the side pieces match. So if I, I can show you really quick the, the two stands, the cross your fingers, this button works. It does. So this is the stand for the um, A10 mini, and it's got this sort of side piece where you can attach things to it. And it's meant to attach, here's a closer, closer up. It's meant to be able to attach um, metal plates and other brackets and stuff as well. These holes match the holes in the Yola box. Those are the same. And there's this hot uh, cold shoe on the back for also attaching things like wireless transmitter or uh, a microphone on the back. And then the Yola box st stand is very, very similar. So I designed it to match. And again, same idea. There's no top bar because you don't really need one here, but it does have the back cold shoe. And that's again for mounting things like a, a, a wireless transmitter or a microphone or anything else. But those are the two main ones that I've been using with it. And um, so yeah, those two stands there, they are meant to match and they both do have the cold shoes. The, the giveaway. So I don't think I think I forgot to put the link in the description, but I will drop it there after the video is done. Uh, but I'm gonna drop the link to the giveaway, today's giveaway in the chat. Today's giveaway is for that stand. So it works the same as the other ones that have been going on this week. I think I got everything updated to the right links and all that. Um, so I, I, I do also wanna just caveat Please only enter the giveaway if you actually have an A10 Mini or are going to buy one because I will ship you a stand and I want to make sure it gets used if you win. Um, but you can choose between the, if you win, you can choose between the small stand for the um, for the A10, A10 Mini or if you uh, want the big one that will, you can, you can win that too if you have the larger A10 Mini Extreme. Either one is, is up for grabs if you're the winner. So... Yeah, all you have to do is go through a couple of these little things. You get bonus entries once you do these three. Um, there will be a secret code on the stream at some point today, which will give you more entries into the giveaway. And I'm not going to tell you where the code is, but it's going to be somewhere in the stream. And uh, you'll have to just kind of pay attention. It will look like a letter followed by six numbers. And that's what I will tell you. Um, that giveaway will run until... Sunday. And on Sunday during my normal stream, I will announce the winners. Um, yeah, if you, if so, one of the actions is to visit me on Instagram, which, um, if you are not already following me on Instagram, please do, because I have been trying to post some fun stuff there, including a little, um, if you, if you want a little sneak peek of some of the stuff I've been working on, take a look at my stories because... This is something I was working on yesterday, right before we went live yesterday. And uh, I was like, hmm, I wonder if I can hang an A10 Mini Extreme off of the front of my new rack. I've been installing a new rack over there for a bunch of my gear. And uh, I was like, huh, I wonder. I wonder if that would work. So I whipped up that really quick. And uh, it's a little bracket that attaches to my stand. And um, then I printed it. And it worked. So I installed that this morning, and now I've got the ATEM Mini Extreme hanging off the front. Seems to be pretty solid. We'll see how long it holds up, but uh, I'm not gonna like make that available for sale just yet because I wanna make sure it actually works long term. But it is um, so far so good. You know, the whole two hours it's been mounted. Um, it's pretty strong. You can even like push the buttons and it doesn't like wiggle. So that's cool. Anyway. That's my plug for my Instagram. Uh, cool. Um, oh, but is that only for the extreme? I 
yeah, I'm not going to make one for the, the A10 Mini, the Mini, the small one, because it's just too small. You'd have to have like two of them side by side. And that's just, I feel like that's just not needed. <laughs> I feel like barely anybody needs that one. Um, oh, here's a good question. Uh, if time permits, can you go into detailed description of how you actually schedule a YouTube live stream? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So, oh, another camera channel followed me on two accounts. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Graham says, I feel we're being shortchanged by Aaron taking tomorrow off, making us wait till Sunday for the next live stream. Yeah, well, too bad. Need a break somewhere in there. All right. So. Let's finish the giveaway from yesterday's stream since um, we need to announce the winner. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the winner of that one. And the winner from the giveaway from, from yesterday is for uh, the for a uh, Raspberry Pi case thing that lets you mount hard drives and stuff to it. Um, also from the manufacturer that makes my stands. So um, hopefully you got a chance to enter that. The, it just ended. And I'm going to go ahead and go in here and draw the winners. And then we will announce them. Here we go. I'm going to make sure that the winner looks like a real person and not a bot. Yeah, I believe so. Wonderful. And here we go. The winner. The winner is. Tony S is the winner. Um, congratulations. I will uh, email you and get your shipping info and then we will um, you'll actually get to choose which Terapi case you want. You get to choose from, from the website. So go ahead and take a look right now. Um, the, the website is the, the, it's from the Inix 3D. So go ahead and take a look and browse around and let me know, uh, well, pick one and uh, I will email you shortly and then we'll get that sent out to you. Congratulations. So. Moving right along. Moving right along. We are going to... We're going to start the overview of the uh, of the ATEM Mini Pro now. So... Uh, ch -ch -ch. Yes, congratulations. Okay, we're going to start the overview of the A10 Mini Pro ISO. So, oh, Keith, thank you for kicking this off with a super chat. <laughs> Happy holidays to you too, and thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. So, the A10 Mini Pro ISO. This is this is something that um, I've been using for quite a while. This is uh, this is the one that I've. I bought this pretty much exactly when it came out. This is the ISO model. And um, this is the top tier of the minis. So there's the A10 mini, the Pro, and the ISO. Uh, quick summary before I guess we get into this of uh, the different, the three different options. So the they are all extremely similar. And the there are just a couple of key differences. So here are the three it, that we're that we're focusing on today: the mini, the pro, and the ISO. The price did just drop a hundred on a hundred dollars on these two a couple of months ago, so these are extremely affordable. Um, the A10 Mini is um, missing a whole bunch of stuff that the pro and the ISO have, so we're not talking about the mini today. Although honestly, a lot of the features are also in that. Um, the main thing that the Pro and the ISO are adding is the ability to record to a, a drive, a hard drive via USB, 
stream over the network to um, YouTube or a streaming bridge or something, anything else. Um, and um, USB, oh, tethering. So the USB port can also tether internet connection from a phone or another USB modem. Um, and then I guess that is more or less it. So um, the only difference in the ISO model compared to the Pro, the only difference is that the ISO model will, when you record, you can have the option to record all four cameras at the same time. The Pro will only record the program feed, the, just like what you're mixing. It'll, it'll record the show that you've mixed, but the ISO model will record all of the individual cameras themselves. Thank you, Noel, for the super chat. Jumping in there with another super chat. I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to, I have the, I have the ISO model here, which is what we're going to be demoing today. But just know that if you have the pro, everything that I will be doing here will work on the pro with the exception of, uh, creating the recording, all the four individual feeds. Um, okay. So the. Oh, Zach is reminding me, one of the other missing features of the original is the multi-view, of course. So on the original A10 Mini, the HDMI out is only for the main show. Um, it does not have the multi-view. The, or the, the, you, can, you can choose what goes out on the HDMI. There's just no multi-view option. The A10 Mini Pro and the ISO have multi-view, which is what you're seeing here, where you see all four inputs, little status information and stuff like that. Of course, that is the other big reason to go with the Pro. Honestly, my um, my the way that I think about these this lineup is um, the the ISO makes a ton of sense if you're going to be doing anything that you plan on editing later. If you never plan on editing a show and you're only live streaming, then you can save three hundred dollars. Art Audio, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Christmas Mimosa and Catnip Fund, excellent. I will put that to good use for sure. Um, my cat will appreciate that. So the, um, yeah, you can save $300 and not get the ISO feature if you, you are never going to be recording stuff uh, for editing later. But in my opinion, it is absolutely worth the $300 to get the ISO model because there's almost no other way to get a recorder that can record four channels of HDMI for that cheap, even $800. Nothing else is around that price point at all. So it's worth it, in my opinion. Um, at $295, the A10 Mini is very, very affordable for what it is. And it is, um, but you're going to have to add other stuff, a lot of other stuff, if you're going to be streaming with it. But if you're only ever using it in Zoom, for example, as a way to just get multiple camera angles into Zoom, or if you do prefer streaming with OBS or Ecamm or any of the other software on your computer, then this is a totally fine option because you wouldn't be using the streaming encoder in here. So um, that's sort of how I'm thinking about the three. I do, I have talked more about these differences in other videos on the channel, so I'll stop there and you can go look for the other videos where I talk about more of the comparisons between the three models. Um, I guess just briefly, the uh, on the extreme, these are basically like bigger versions of the minis. So everything that the minis have, this has more of. So as we go through the features, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of mention um, as we're going live, uh, as we're going live through the features, what the extreme adds. And the um, one of the, the biggest features that the extreme has that the minis don't is what I'm using right now for this view which is showing you my computer screen shrunk down and myself shrunk down and cropped on top of a background. And that's what they call super source, which is Blackmagic's name for doing this kind of layout. And the extremes, both of the extreme models have that feature and the original ATEM minis do not have that feature, which is uh, means you are much more limited in the layouts you can create. Um, thank you, another camera channel. Uh, remember to record at zero bit rate for the best quality. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Um, that is uh, terrible advice, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I will, um, if we get, if we get, um, if we get 
through most of what I want to talk to in a reasonable amount of time, I will demonstrate what happens in, when you record at zero bit rate. So you can see uh, exactly what's going on. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the questions to see if we have any questions about the sort of overview of the lineup, and then we'll jump in. So Sanford says, can you talk about wire management on these devices so the weight does not damage the connectors? Um, yeah, so my, <laughs> well, you can take a look at what I've got right now. Um, let's see if I can spin this around. The way I have this rigged up right now is um, these are all like bundled up here. And what that does is it means that there's actually not a lot of weight pulling down on here because a lot of these are kind of stiff and they're kind of holding themselves up. So I am a big um, believer in not using huge cables on small devices. So you know, you notice I don't have the clips for my case. I do have optional add-on clips that'll hold it down. So this thing, you know, does lift up and you can get little clips that you can attach, which will bolt it down. Um, I, I made those because I was seeing a lot of people complain about like, oh, if you have really thick cables, it's going to pull down. But like, I, you see, I can't even make it do that. These cables are just so slim. So I like using really slim cables that are not super heavy just to avoid weight on this in the first place. Um, but if you can't do that for some reason, then try to strap it to something. Um, if they're heavier, they will, then the strapping to themselves probably won't work, but you could attach them to the table or maybe even strap them to this little rear foot. That's how I manage wires with these. Um, and then also using appropriate length cables. So uh, I have the HDMI out of the ATEM is actually going into this monitor. And you can see this cable is only like a foot long. So, and it's slim. So I like getting small cables, slim cables, short ones, just the length you need and not a lot extra. Let's see if I can get that back in the right spot. Uh, looks good. Okay. Oh, I saw um, I saw Zach was asking about this colored cube. What is this colored cube? Um, that is it. It is a colored cube. It serves no purpose other than being colorful on my desk, but I like it. I think it looks fun. Um, okay, other questions about the the lineup. The uh, let's see. We'll I'll get to some of these other questions, specific questions later once we get into the features. Um, if I'm not, uh, I just again a reminder. If you do want to uh, make sure that I see your questions, put the letter Q in front, and that filters it out separately on my screen. Um, if I'm not answering your question right away. Don't worry. I'm not like trying to be rude. I'm just trying to roughly group the topics into into clusters so that the um, when I do timestamps, the topics are relatively focused and not all over the place. So okay, the Okay, I'm going to talk about audio and stuff later. Cool. Um, what is the model number of the monitor mounted on the stand? So this is one of my uh, favorites for the ATEM Mini. It is the um, it mounts on this on the stand nicely. It is not too heavy, which is nice. This one is the uh, there it is. So it is the uh, Feel World T7. I just dropped the link in the chat. So seven inch monitor, um, it is, uh, yeah, it has a pass through. So what this is doing for, for this stream, it means that um, I can see the monitor right here, but then the output is actually going into my ATEM, my, my main streaming, so that I can show you the multi-view of this. So you are um, seeing the multi-view of the, ATEM Mini Pro uh, on, on the screen right now because I can feed that out. So that's one of the reasons I like that monitor. Um, 
Ryland says, um, love my mini pro, but no super source makes me jealous. The super source is fantastic. It's the, it's my favorite feature. It's, it's, you know, the, the lets you do the side by side or, or four up, uh, inputs over other backgrounds and stuff, which is super, super cool. Um, the, but yeah, the A10 mini pro does not have it. That's one of the main reasons I would recommend considering the extremes is that they, they do have that. And uh, remind me, the, the headphone jack was added to the extreme, but is not on the originals. So let's talk about um, let's talk about the audio really quick. Um, the A10 Mini Pro. So this this lineup, the inputs and outputs on all three models are exactly the same. There's four inputs for HDMI, where you can see the four cameras here. There's an HDMI out, so you can see the monitor, which the Pro and the ISO have the multi-view. Then there's two microphone inputs over on the on the side. Two microphone or line inputs. So you can use them for uh, wireless microphones like this one is the Hollyland. Um, you could also plug in an iPod Touch for music into one of them. And you can choose between mic and line level, which we'll get to uh, later once we actually start going through the audio. There's also a um, USB port, which does several things. It's how you can get the webcam out to a computer. You can record to a hard drive. You can tether a phone for internet. Um, and then there's ethernet for putting it on the network, which is very, very important. Um, wired ethernet, there is no Wi-Fi built into this. And then power. And I should also, I should also uh, mention the the uh, power switch situation. So there is no switch on, there is no power switch on the ATEM. It is just, when you plug it in, it's on. And that is, I think because most of the time what uh, the gear that Blackmagic makes is um, for installing in studios and it's like rack gear that's just in a production studio and it's on all the time. I'm, I think it was a mistake to not include a power switch on the on the small versions of this because people are using it at home and these buttons are you know bright and people might want to turn off their gear. So the um, the there is, however, a solution which I'm dropping the link to this in the chat. There is a power switch you can buy that somebody very nicely made, and we actually did a giveaway for this last week. But you can kind of see back here. It is a power switch. It kind of like is a pass through. So if you, maybe this, maybe this one shows it better. Yeah. So you can see this end is the uh, actual A10 mini power supply from Blackmagic. This is a sort of insert. And then this attaches into the A10 mini. And then you can actually use this physical switch to turn it on and off. So that's a nice little um, add on you can get if you want. And um, that is available um, on, on eBay from someone who has uh, been making them. So, um, and we, yeah, we did a giveaway for four of them last week, which was very nice of them to, to do that for us. So, okay, that's the, that's the deal with um, inputs and outputs on the back. The sides are the fans, so the uh, don't block the sides. I believe I believe it's blowing warm air out that way and pulling cold air in this way. So just make sure these sides are um, are left uncovered. One other thing I just remembered. Um, the let's see if I can find this link. Yeah. Oh, is that the right one? Yes, it is. So the um, one other thing to mention is this deck saver cover. So I dropped that link in the chat. The deck saver is this little transparent cover for the A10 Mini Pro. And <laughs> this does a couple of things. One, it means uh, it's like a dust cover. So it, it'll collect dust so the dust, you can see it's very dusty. Uh, that way the dust doesn't go onto the ATEM. But also because there's no power switch, this is a nice way to um, store your A10 Mini on your desk and not accidentally push buttons on it like the Go Go Live button. 
and I saw somebody commented, uh, no power switch means accidentally starting a live stream. <laughs> Awkward. Yep, I agree. Um, but when we talk about scheduling a stream on YouTube, I'll also mention a trick for that as well. But yeah, the deck saver cover means you can't accidentally press any of the buttons. So this is, um, this is a nice little solution from them. And they were very nice enough to send me this out to, to review and share with you all. So, okay. That is, I think, enough about the physical physical characteristics of the ATEM. Oh, Chris is reminding me, the cover won't work if we use a retaining clips. It is true. They are not com they are not compatible. The cover requires the uh, takes the place of the clips. There's no way to put the clips. Uh, I don't have them here, otherwise I would show you, but they kind of hook over the ATEM and then, yeah, you can't use the cover. So it's one or the other. Um, personally, I think um, for like, if you have slim HDMI cables and are using it like at home, I, I don't usually use the clips with mine because I don't have any real weight being pulled back uh, on there. So it doesn't ever run the risk of flipping up. Um, but if you were installing it somewhere, like maybe in a more public venue, then the clips can be a nice extra little bit of security so that you don't have somebody accidentally bumping it. Um, does the cover come in extreme sizes? It does. They also have an extreme version, which is super, super great. <laughs> Art says you need to market a fade to black cover that, yeah. Um, the fade to black button, we'll talk about the buttons in a second, but the, the big button in the corner is fade to black, which I have absolutely accidentally pressed before. And um, it just makes the whole stream go away. And um, I feel like maybe it could have just been smaller. It doesn't need to be that big. Anyway, yeah. It would be nice. I've been thinking about making a little cover that screws into that hole and sort of stretches out over this so that you can't push that button anymore. Um, here's a question about the line inputs. Do you actually use the mic line inputs? I've heard complaints that the preamps on these inputs are noisy. Um, I do, in fact, use these. So, in fact, right now, um, the audio that you are hearing right now on this stream is, uh, it's my microphone overhead, which is uh, a, a little Samson C02, but that's routed into my audio mixer. The audio mixer is outputting analog output into my ATEM Mini Extreme that is mixing this show. And the ATEM Mini Extreme, this is the multi-view from the Extreme, you can see the only audio source enabled right now is mic one. So this audio that you're hearing on this stream right now is coming in through the input, analog input, mic one on the A10 Mini Extreme. So it seems like you can absolutely get a reasonable result with it. Um, but it is the line level. I'm not setting this one to mic levels. But we'll do another test again when I uh, when we start going through this. I have the Hollyland transmitter here. So we'll try that one out today. And you'll hear the audio from that mic. Is there a place for the fade to black button? I have yet to hear anybody who has a use for it. I mean, it's one way to end a show, right? You can just be like, all right, we're done. And then you fade to black. Um, again, I never use that because I would rather fade to a image, which I will show you how to do. Okay. So that's the inputs and outputs on the ATEM. What is next? So let's talk about, let's talk about um, what else you need in order to use this effectively. So, oh, Rick has a good point. Maybe you can recommend a firmware update to Blackmagic that the fade to black button requires you hold it down for three seconds or some number so that you can't accidentally bump it. I like that idea. I think that's a great feature. I think that would make a lot of sense. Okay, let's talk about what else you need in order to use this. So you might notice that there is, for example, no screen on the ATEM Mini Pro. There is no monitor. And there are a lot of buttons, which we will talk about um, shortly, but 
you will need, you will probably need a monitor. Um, you don't technically have to have a monitor if you like have everything set up and know what you're doing, but it is extremely useful to see the status of things and uh, especially the multi view. So you will probably need a monitor for your A10 mini. And even though there are a lot of buttons and there, it sure looks like there's an awful lot on here. Even though there's a lot of buttons, there's a lot of things that you can't do with the buttons. There's a lot of features of the A10 mini that are only accessible through their software. So this is, um, this is, let's talk about the software control really quick. Uh, trying to get back to my other ATEM. The first thing you should do when you get this to um, set it up is go to the Blackmagic website and download the software control app. So this is an app that runs on your computer. Uh, go here, scroll down, click on live production switchers, download the latest ATEM switchers software. And it's for both Mac and Windows, there is no Linux version. Um, you will want to use this and run this on your computer in order to get the most out of the ATEM. The, without the software, there's not a whole lot you can do with it other than basic camera switching. Um, in order to configure stream keys and uh, really take advantage of all the, the layering options, the, the graphics capabilities, you will need the software. So what it looks like is this. And this is, um, oh, come on, this is the wrong one. This is my extreme. I need to get into the Mini Pro. Uh, what is, why is it not <laughs> letting me switch? Some, this is, the, there are some bugs. Uh, okay, let's, there's my TV studio. Let's see if I can switch back to the A10 Mini Pro. Um, it's like it, that's the extreme. What's going on? It's like it lost the network connection. Maybe I accidentally yanked out the network cord. That seems possible. Um, I think the bug in here is if I, it like fell back to a different one, but it thinks it's connected to the Mini Pro. So I can't select Mini Pro again. I have to go select something else and then select the Mini Pro. All right, so first um, live demo. <laughs> First live demo fail is something happened to the ATEM Mini and it is not showing up on the network. Also, I actually just realized um, it thinks there's a hard drive plugged in and there's not. I, there is no USB plugged in right now. So I don't know why it thinks there's a hard drive plugged in. See how it says ISO stop and it, it's showing me a hard drive name and time remaining. There is no drive plugged in. So I think something got hung up and I'm just going to, um, I'm going to reboot it with the handy dandy power switch. So uh, turn that off, turn it back on. It should boot up pretty quick. And I sure hope I saved all the graphics in there. Um, okay, now the, yeah, now the hard drive is not there. So let's go back and connect to it. Oops, I forgot to do my own, take my own advice and switch to one of the ones that does work and then switch back to the A10 Mini Pro ISO. There we go. Now, now we're back. Um, okay, so did my, did it save all my graphics? It did. It did. That's good. Um, so, okay, a couple things about the software control. Uh, this is this is the sort of main screen of the device. You see your uh, inputs, your uh, with the short name of them. A couple of other things over here. A lot of these buttons are empty because on the bigger switchers there are more inputs, and then these would have uh, names and these will be active. This section here is uh, for the upstream key, which I'll talk about what that is later. This is for the downstream key. You have a big fake T bar for doing transitions. Um, you can choose your transition transition styles here. Uh, these buttons are for the program, which means that's what's uh, like on the air. This is for preview, which is for queuing things up to do a transition. Here's a virtual fade to black button. And over in the sidebar is where you get all the options for, oh dear, why did it just disconnect?
That's interesting. I don't know why that happened. Okay. It lost it. And that's my extreme. Something is not good here. This is going to be a quick demo if I can't get the software control to work. Okay, it's back. That's a little concerning. I have not had that happen before. Um, I wonder if... I wonder if... So I should also mention a limit with this. Um, the ATEM can have five things connected to it. So you only get the ability to connect five things to it. Every time you connect something to the ATEM Mini, that eats up one of its connections. So this software control talking to the ATEM Mini counts as one. If you have other things like an iPad connected to it or a uh, or a, a, other kinds of controllers like Companion, for example, those will take up one of the connections. And the um, the the uh, so you can only have five of those. And what will happen is if you then connect a new one, it'll like boot off one of the old ones. So that's um, possibly when you see your software control app just like get disconnected and then try to reconnect, that's possibly what's happening there. So, okay, are there any other questions about this? Um, Can you use a computer monitor or HDMI on the small TV or does it need to, be, need to be this kind of monitor? Good question. So I use this small one here um, just because I want it on top of the, the ATEM on the stand, but no, it can absolutely be a different, a larger monitor or a different kind of monitor. One of the other reasons I like this, this style monitor is because of the pass-through. So the ATEM goes into here, but then I can also output that to other things. So I can have um, the multi-view in front of me and I can also share it on the stream or if you were doing a production with um, uh, doing a production with other people, you can have your small one in front of you, and then like a larger TV elsewhere. Um, there are some of the some of the monitors I've tried don't work, and it has to do with how it negotiates a frame rate with the monitor. They they did push out an update relatively recently that that made it work with a whole bunch of new monitors that uh, or other monitors that previously were having trouble um, but it is possible that you could you will find a monitor that it doesn't work with and um, it like it'll try to send the right frame rate for the monitor so if your monitor like supports 60 hertz it'll try to go up to 60 hertz even if your ATEM is set to a different frame rate Um, Graham is reminding me about the other ATEM setup program. So let's talk about the other software available on for the ATEM. There, there are, confusingly, two different software apps for controlling the ATEM. One is called the ATEM Software Control, which is this one. And this is the main one you'll be using when you're like choosing camera angles and um, setting up graphics and uh, configuring your, your chroma key and stuff like that. The other software is called ATEM Setup. And this one is also how you configure a streaming bridge, but um, it's for it's more like configuring some of the more fundamental settings on the device. I don't really know how to describe what things show up in here. Um, this, as long as your computer is plugged into the same network as the ATEM or if you're connected over USB, it should just show up automatically in the soft in the setup app as well as in the software control. And then if you press this button over here, this opens up the settings for it. So this is where, for example, you, um, uh, oh, you can't change the network settings if you're connected over the network, which makes sense. But if I was connected over USB, I could choose static IP or DHCP. Um, and then this, this connection priority, this is if you are streaming via a USB uh, tethering to your phone, you can choose whether you want it to prioritize mobile or Ethernet. I usually leave it in Ethernet because I usually stream on a wired connection. These settings, panel settings, are all about the physical, the physical device. So this is where you can choose between your switching mode, program preview, or cut bus. Uh, so what that does is um, the buttons here, right now the way I've set it up is it's in cut bus mode, which means 
no, watch, watch up here. When I press one of these, it's going to immediately cut, right? So as soon as I press one of the input buttons, it will immediately jump. If I switch it to uh, program preview mode, then what happens is when I press one, it turns green and you can see the green outline. I'll show you the, uh, the multi view here. So when I press one of the physical buttons, the, the multi view turns green and if you, and the program is not changing, right? And if I want to then show that on the screen, I have to press cut or auto. So cut does a hard cut and then auto will do whatever transition is currently active. So that is one of the settings you might want to change uh, right off the bat, which is depending on how you want to use it, program preview or cut bus. Um, personally, I leave it in cut bus mode because I, if I'm going to do a, if I'm going to be using the preview to set up a scene, or if I'm going to be doing uh, something where I want a transition, I'm probably going to be doing something more advanced than just pressing one button to cut cameras. So I'm going to be end, I'm going to end up using creating a scene in some sort of automation tool like Companion or using macros and doing that all sort of separately. Where again, it's not that you can't do preview and a transition if this is set to cut bus. This is just about the buttons on the device. So I leave this in cut bus mode because I want to treat the buttons on the device as like an emergency cut. So if I if if I notice that something is wrong or like someone someone's computer is plugged in and they yanked the cord out and then I need to very quickly cut away from it. I want to be able to very quickly push a button and jump to that input. Um, and then a couple other settings here. Uh, let's see. I'm actually going to come back to these later because we need to talk about the picture in picture and chroma key features first. Um, but the other setting I should mention right now while we're here is the button brightness. This is something they added a while ago, which is great because um, the buttons can get extremely bright. Uh, you probably can't let's see if I can turn my shutter speed and see if I can change my exposure on this camera to show this better. Let's see, let's turn this down. There we go. So this is the brightness at a hundred percent. And if I drag it down, you can see they actually can get pretty dim, which is nice. These are extremely bright and they will light up a room. So like if you have this in a in a in a room that where you then turn off the lights like your living room or your office or something the buttons are fully bright it will put a lot of light out so i usually have mine set down kind of low so they don't blind me but i'm actually going to leave them up for now so you can see them on here better okay that's what i wanted to mention there so yeah this setup app is for the panel settings as well as the network settings those are the basically the um the configuration options there everything else you're going to be doing in the software control app okay anything else about the apps really quick let's take a look at the questions um graham says i set the button brightness to the lowest possible level one percent very dim i feel like it's not quite enough for me so i uh i usually have them around 20 percent. but oh man these are really bright um, Andre says some computer monitors, for example, Dell will not work, but when you switch to multi-view, it will. Um, that's yeah. Dell is one of the ones I've had trouble with. Um, and the, this monitor over, over here is actually, um, this is a Dell monitor and it, it was extremely cheap. It's the one that's really blurry back here. Um, extremely cheap Dell monitor, 27 inches, 1080. And it only supports, um, I forget what frame rate. It only supports like one frame rate, which basically means as I'm switching different sources over to that monitor, some of them just didn't show up. So I had to put a scaler behind it, which is like really sad that I had to <laughs> use a $300 device to make my $200 monitor work. Uh, but yeah. Oh, Patrick says, can you talk about mix effect and if you can do everything in mix effect that you can do with the ATEM software control? Um, I'm not going to do a, to a full demo of mix effect, but, uh, cause that is a whole nother video, but I should mention it at least briefly, uh, because it is, uh, worth mentioning since we are talking about software, the, let's see, do I have it on my phone? Otherwise I'm gonna have to go grab an iPad. I do. Okay, great. So, okay. Mix effect is 
an app for um, iOS only. Drop that link in the chat. Um, it is a it is an app for iOS. It runs both on an iPhone and an iPad. It's probably easier to use on an iPad, but I'm going to show it to you on the phone right now. And um, it is more or less a complete replacement for Blackmagic's own software switcher for Mac and uh, Windows. And um, it is not a free app. It is a $50 app, but it is absolutely worth it. It also has a trial, so if you want to try it, you can. Um, there is a free version, but it it uh, limits some of the features available. So I'm going to show it to you on my phone. Oh, I might need to make a super source layout for this because, yeah, I don't have a good one here. So, oh, wait, actually, this might be it. Nope. I'm going to fix that button really quick. Uh, box two is that. Okay. So you get the cropped view of my phone, but whatever, it's fine. Um, oh, so yeah, actually a lot of the features are locked. You can see I don't have the pro version on my phone, um, which I should be able to restore the purchases. Let's see if this works. There we go. Um, Adam, the developer sent me the, the license for the pro version, which is very nice of him. Um, okay. Now we've got the pro features unlocked. So basically this is like, oh, this is on my extreme. Um, let me connect this to my ATEM mini, um, down here. Let's see. Switchers. It found it on the network. ATEM mini. Oh no, it didn't. That's when it's at home. Um, I think we have to add it here. Add a new switcher. We'll do ATEM. Oh my gosh. I can't type ATEM. Wow. I really can't type ATEM mini pro. ISO, it was 10, 11, 200.9. And, oh, it found it on the network. I didn't have to do that. There we go. Add that switcher, connect. And this counts as one of the connections. Now I have two things connected to it. Hopefully nothing else jumped onto it. Um, so, okay, this is connected. Now when I have it selected, all these now are affecting the ATEM Mini. So you can see it's got the same uh, buttons that show up in the main app. It's got all these buttons, it's got buttons for all the macros. Um, it has all the audio settings. It has, uh, it even has the, the media so you can load graphics in this way, which is really cool because you can actually like um, load stuff in from your camera roll, which is nice. And then uh, it has actually more settings than the Blackmagic software does. For example, it can, um, oh, this one isn't the extreme, but on the extreme, you can actually, um, can set up super source layouts with like a visual editor, which is really nice. And then, uh, some of the things that this does that the uh, Blackmagic software doesn't do is like better ma macro management. Like I can see in a nice list, all the different macros that are loaded in there. We'll talk about what those are later. Um, but anyway, there's a ton of settings in here and it is a very, very useful app. I think at this point you can probably get away with only using the mix effect app and not even using Blackmagic's app if you really wanted to. He's been doing a very good job uh, about that. Uh, yeah, Adam, Adam Tao rules, super smart designer. Um, we did a, we did a live stream with him actually on, on here a while ago. He came and, um, came and did a stream with me demoing early version of Mix Effect. Okay. But I'm not going to focus on Mix Effect because actually he has a, he has a lot of videos on his channel. So I'm going to drop his channel link into the chat as well, because he does a lot of, uh, a lot of demos of, of mix effect on his channel. So there is his link.
Okay. So back to the Black Magic app. Um, no, not back to the Black Magic app. We talked about the app. We talked about. setting up the control surface. Um, okay, actually, while we're talking about mix effects, and that's another way to talk to uh, control it, let's also talk briefly about uh, one of the other ways to control it, which is one of the ones I use a ton, um, which is called companion. So um, companion is a separate, separate, totally separate app. It was originally designed for using with stream decks, which are this, um, it's this thing from Elgato that has all these keys on it with little screens. And um, you don't have to have a, <coughs> excuse me. I don't know what that was. <clears throat> Oof, sorry, okay. Um, you don't have to have a Stream Deck to use it, but it is one of the best ways to use it. It Also, you can load up the buttons on like an iPad if you don't mind touchscreen, but I prefer the physical buttons quite a lot. Um, the Companion, you can run it on a Mac or Windows or on a Raspberry Pi, which is actually my preferred way to do it. Basically, what it means is that I have a Raspberry Pi sitting over in my server rack, and I have this Stream Deck plugged into the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this one actually happens to be connected over a USB extension cable, a little powered 20-foot USB extender. I think I put the link in the description for that uh, because this is too far away from the Pi to have a regular length USB cable. So this, um, you can plug in multiple of them too. So I have this one and I have one over on my desk as well. And both of those are connected into the software in the Raspberry Pi. But you can run it on a laptop as well. This, again, counts against one of your five connections to the ATEM if you have that running. And uh, this can do a lot of the things that the software control can do, but not everything. There's are, there are some of the things that are they're missing from it. So this is what it looks like to set it up. These are the buttons I'm using right now for this show. And uh, let me go jump over to like a new page so that we can make new buttons to talk to the ATEM Mini Extreme. First of all, I need to connect it to the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. I think it might be this one. Let's see. ATEM Mini ISO, it looks... Why can't I edit? Enable, connecting, edit. Yeah, okay, so it is that one. 200.9. Um, it has support for the ATEM Mini built into the software. So now that this is connected, I should probably name this... Yeah, okay, named ATEM Mini ISO. Now that that's connected, and you can see it actually talks to a lot of other stuff. So I've got it connected to my home automation system. I've got it connected to the video router. It can talk to HyperDex. It can talk to the ATEM Mini Extreme. Um, it can talk to OBS. It can talk to uh, the web presenter, the, my audio mixer. It's got a ton of stuff. Um, actually, it can also talk to Mix Effect, which is a new feature in Mix Effect. So if you, it's a nice way to sort of uh, automate controlling Mix Effect, which is like, I realize very meta, go look at Adam's video about that because that is a whole rabbit hole to go down. Um, but now that this is connected, we can go make some buttons. So for example, there are um, presets, which are like useful buttons that you might may, might always want to use. So we'll take the ATEM Mini ISO and then there's like, it'll give you buttons for um, program cuts, for example. So we can go to the program menu and then we can go and make a button for each of the four inputs. So I can just drag main, computer, side, and my overhead, and then um, we'll do media player one. So what this has done is these are like preset buttons and notice that the this one is red because these buttons can have a feedback state. So every button can be assigned a uh, an action, one or more actions, as well as feedback to like change the, the look of the button in certain conditions. So this button is set to change the program input to the main camera. The label is the, um, this is like a variable, so 
it's grabbing the name from the ATEM, which is nice. Otherwise, you could also just type camera one. And uh, but I like having it use the variables for those. And then the feedback is when the main camera is on the air, it'll turn red. So those are some nice shortcuts. But then you can also make buttons to do other things. So let's um, let's uh, what I usually end up doing for for buttons on this is like I have a button that that puts the ATEM into the pre-show state of like load up the title graphic, put the graphic on the air, turn off the microphone, and then I have a button to start the show, which will switch to the camera or preview the camera, enable the microphone, start a transition, um, and do all those things in a row. Um, I'm actually going to wait on those because I want to first explain about. There's a lot. There's a lot to this. This is going to be a long stream. I'm going to first. I need to first explain about just basic transitions and stuff too. Um, so the short version is um, this is a yet another way to control the ATEM and these buttons. Now, if I press them, they will actually affect the ATEM. So if I show you, I can um, press the button in companion and it is changing the camera in the ATEM. So that's another really good option, very powerful. Um, when we get to actually creating a show with this, I'll go through and make those buttons I talked about. What Pi OS are you using to host Companion? Um, I am using the, I guess, previous generation OS because I installed this last year. So I think it should work on the, I think it should work on the latest OS just fine. Um, but basically I just went through Companion's own instructions for installing it on a Pi and it worked fine. Andre says, I was thinking the same, you need a five hour stream at the shortest. Yeah, this is going to be a, this is going to be a long one. Um, but again, I'm going to try to keep this sort of in, in order and topically clustered so that the timestamps make sense and you can skip around to looking at this uh, again later. And yes, smash that like button. Thank you. Um, okay, other questions about Companion before we move on. Um, is BitFocus Companion open source? Can you rely on this app in critical productions? Those are two different questions, <laughs> but but I would say yes and yes. Um, it is open source. The source is available on GitHub. You can install it for free. It's entirely free to use. I don't even think there's a way to pay them other than just uh, donating. Um, yeah, they have like a donate button on their website, but there's no like uh, extra features that you unlock or anything. And um, I would, it's been very reliable. I would absolutely use this in production. And I know a lot of people who do use this in production environments. Will I be able to pause and rewatch later or will it be deleted? You will absolutely be able to rewatch this later. Don't worry about it. This is the stream is not going anywhere. This is going to stay up and hopefully be a useful uh, overview of the, of the ATEM Mini Pro. All right. We're going to get to, we're going to get back to companion later. Um, so we've talked now about the three main ways to control this, the buttons on the device, the black magic, black magic's app, the software control, uh, mix effect on an iPad or iPhone, and then, um, companion on a raspberry Pi or on a computer are all great ways to control this. So moving on from control. Um, oh, I guess actually on on that control topic, um, my I feel like it's uh, both a positive and a minus here. Comparing with the some of the other switches we looked at this week and I've talked about on this channel, um, I really the the fact that you can connect companion to this and um, is one of like one of the main reasons that it continues to be the sort of anchor around how I do all of my streams in the studio. I'm using the ATEM Mini Extreme right now because I want the eight inputs and then the super source, super source to be able to do the super source layouts. But it, without the external control capability, it would not be nearly as powerful. At the same time, the buttons on here are very limiting. So you pretty much have to use an external control. The buttons do let you choose camera angles. You get some audio capabilities as well. Um, 
a lot of these over here, not super useful. So a lot of the features are not accessible via the actual buttons and you have to use a software app in order to control it. So it's both good and bad, but again, the fact that there is the option to integrate companion with it means it is extremely, um, it's able to be the sort of center of, of this whole setup. Um, and Andre says, don't forget the old Strata apps. I did forget because I haven't used them in so long. Um, there's another set of I iOS apps, which I don't know when they were last updated, uh, but they're called Strata. There's a couple different ones. There's a app that is essentially just the uh, program and preview buttons for doing the, the switching. There's another app called Strata Macros, which just gives you a big grid of buttons to run macros. We're we'll gonna talk about macros later. Um, and there was another one, which I don't, oh, I think there's like a Strata Lite, which does even more limited switching. I haven't been using those in a long time. I used to recommend them a lot, but um, Mix Effect blows those out of the water by far. Like Mix Effect is so much better than the Strata apps. Um, so I would 100% just, just get the Mix Effect app. No question. Um, and then I don't have an Android device, but thanks for pointing this out. Uh, Meta Control for the Android users, wonderful. I have not tried that one. Okay, so moving on, moving on. Let's talk about camera switching and transitions. I wish I had a better way to do chapters in this ahead of time because I need to, I'm gonna add this timestamp later. Okay. Oh, I can use a singer. Okay. We're going to talk now about camera switching and transitions between angles. And in order to do this, I'm going to actually start showing you the, uh, the feed from the A10 Mini Pro. And I just realized we're going to have to take a little trip behind the scenes again because I need to first make a layout for you so that you can see what's going on on my ATEM as well as see my um, my camera. So I can show you the multi-view, but I want to also, maybe that is big enough. Because you, you got, you can see, you can see my fingers in here. Okay, that's good enough for now. This is good enough for now. So Camera switching and transitions. Um, let's see. I want to keep it there so I can see the comments. The buttons on the device are one way to switch between angles, right? You can choose the different cameras. I have mine in cut mode, which we talked about at the beginning, which is how I usually prefer to leave it, just so that when I push something, it immediately cuts. The other option you have is in that um, preview preview program preview mode, which I am going to switch it to right now. And in that mode, when I press one of these, the preview one changes, and then I can hit the transition. Let's talk about transition options really quick. I have right now this button selected, which is the little um, partially white on the left, and then it's got the, the black side. It's meant to represent a, a wipe. So as I, when I press that, you can see it's doing the soft wipe across the screen. The, these buttons over here are for the duration. So I can choose half a second. I can choose two seconds, which is very slow, uh, or in between. Those are the only options you get on the buttons, but there's a lot more options in the software. So going back into the uh, software app, you can see that this, these, this section here is talking about the transitions. So we've got the same mix, dip, wipe, DVE. These all correspond to buttons on the ATEM itself. So mix, dip, wipe, and then this one is the DVE button. Um, but these give you more limited options within there. And we're going to look at the full options available in the software app. Um, let's look at what the different, the quick versions of what these do. Um, the rate you can change between any number of frames now in this compared to on the device. So on the device, I can choose half a second, one second, one and a half or two seconds. Um, 
I, I like to leave it at half a second. I feel like that's a reasonable duration. So let's uh, go into this view and I'm going to first show you the mix transition. So it took whatever was in preview and did a sort of crossfade over, which I think is a very nice one. I think it looks uh, very reasonable. Here is dip. Dip, I guess we need to start looking at this uh, the sidebar here. Um, over in the over in the sidebar in the of the software app, there's this transitions section, and this is where you can change settings for each transition. So in mix, the only option is the rate. In dip, you can choose what do you want to dip to. So dip is going to go from the preview image before it sort of crossfades to the preview. It's going to go and show you a different picture in the middle. And you can dip through any of your sources or um, media player or colors. So let's just choose color bars. Color bars are built in. So for example, if I uh, switch to the color bar input, you can see it just has bars. Um, so we'll go back here. Um, the ATEM is set to ATEM is set to dip transition through color bars. So now when I press the auto button, see how it did the sort of dissolve, but it also went through the color bars. If I change that to media player, what's in my media player right now? So I've got my like channel art in the media player. So I'll go back here and then it's going to dip through the channel art. So that's probably not a good one to use. Maybe it makes more sense to use my just um, RGB. Yeah, no, it's a little better. So you can do dip through or a flat color. Um, this also has a color generator it has two color generators, which show up as inputs as well. So you can choose a color here. Um, color. Oh, here's a little picker. So we can choose my red. And over here, we can choose my green. And now I have the color generators. So if we are looking at the ATEM, I can press a color on air, which is not super useful. Um, but what you what you can do is you can now dip through one of the colors. So now let's dip through a solid color, which is um, not using the media pool, which is nice because it saves it saves. It means you can put whatever you want in your media pool also. Um, wipe is gives you all these little fun effects. So again, on the buttons themselves, there's only really two options, horizontal wipe or vertical wipe. You can see it's pressing the first two options in the wipe is when I'm pressing the physical buttons here. So horizontal wipe looks like that. Vertical wipe looks like that, just like you'd expect. It has these other options as well. So this is the um, from the center going out. There's from the center going up. There's a star pattern or a grid pattern. There's um, going from the center, there's going from the center in a diamond shape. There's also a circle shape going from the corner, going from the other corner. You get the idea, all sorts of fun things. Uh, and there's like a diagonal one. Some of the other options for the for the wipes, though, are you can actually choose how soft you want that border to be. So I, I think they were all set to 83%. So if I turn the softness down, for example, and then go back and show you it's just a hard line going going through it, right? Or you can, um, you can actually add a border of one of from one of the inputs like a color. So that's going to look like that. Now you got a little color stripe going through. Or if we did a fill source is actually let's say, um, my overhead camera, and then we can go between the side camera and the main camera. This is going to, do you see that? I might have to slow it down. Uh, let's do two seconds. It's taking my camera as the border. So you could do some interesting things with that, I think. I'm not sure what you would do with it, but it's kind of neat. Um, so those are all the things available in the wipe. And then the last transition type is called DVE. DVE is um, a weird name for it, but um, 
notice that all of these other things are essentially taking one picture and then doing something to it statically, if that makes sense. Um, like the wipes with with a with without the border, the wipe is just sort of changing how much of the two layers are visible, right? You've got your your preview and your program, and then it's going to change how much of those are visible on the program out. So I'm you know wiping across. None of the pictures are not moving. They're just it's just over changing the overlap. What DBE lets you do is actually scoot things around. So this is what it looks like. Um, oops, that's not right. Um, there, DBE. So do you see how the whatever was in the program actually shifted rather than just like a wipe? So there's a lot of different options here. Again, you can push to different corners. You can also do a squeeze effect where it scrunches what was in the, whatever's in the program. That's called DVE because it's doing more actual processing of the image rather than just sort of changing what's overlapping. Um, there's also this um, effects button here. So I was showing it to you without the effects. I was showing you just like the squeeze. Um, maybe what I need to do is a way to show. I need to I need to show you the program out of this with this software control on the screen. Also, that might be helpful. Um, so, but okay, before we do that, let's talk about um, effects. What this does is um, effects will, um, effects will take, for example, media player one, which is my RGB background and scoot that over this, over the screen, which is kind of like a stinger. It doesn't make sense for, uh, for that kind of graphic. It makes more sense if you have like a tall, skinny graphic. So we might have to make that. It's like if you want like a like a custom graph, custom text that's part of your wipe, uh, and you wouldn't make it full with like that. We'll come back to that one, and then um, so that's DBE, and then yeah the. Those are your different transition options. Um, okay, other questions about about that. Um, nope. Okay, great. So transitions. Again, most of those are only accessible through the software control or uh, like mix effect as well. Um, but this is really where you get you get to start using the preview and program because the whole reason this these are working is because um, I have a different source over in the preview image compared to what's in the program so that I'm I keep trying to change that so that it is um, switching from taking whatever was in preview and bringing that onto the air. Okay, the Next topic, let's talk about the, um, let's talk about the keyers while we're, yeah, while we're in here. So the ATEM Mini Pro ISO has one upstream key and one downstream key. I really don't know why they call this next transition, um, but this is, this is the upstream key buttons. There, and you'll also notice it corresponds to on the on the software here. You get upstream key one and downstream key. Um, in the extreme, I can just pop over here really quick. In the extreme, you'll notice that there are more. You get four upstream keys and two downstream keys. So keep that in mind as we're going through this because the ATEM Mini Pro is limited to one of each. So there is quite a bit of limits to what you can do with them. But we're going to talk about what these are. Uh, in order to do that, what I want to do is actually uh, show you a graphic I made earlier, um, which is which is um, it's going to be in the extreme. Did I put it in there already? I 
did. Let me just cue that up so I can show it to you. So the um, the box two is media player one, and now when I do this, it should work. There we go. Okay. I made this diagram to help illustrate what upstream and downstream keys are. The I like to think of these as layers. So the bottom layer in red, the input select, that one is um, all of the, the different inputs you have. So you've got your four HDMIs. You've also got the media player, which counts as an input, uh, where you can pick one image to show there. You can choose black. If you want, you can choose the color bar graphic, or you can choose any of the two color generators, generators we looked at. Input select is the bottom layer. Think of that as like, you're just going to slap something down there. Um, the transitions also work on that layer. So like when you're doing the wipes and stuff, it'll work on that layer and just change that bottom layer. The upstream key goes on top of that. You can use the upstream key to layer things over whatever is selected. And there are four different ways you can use the upstream key. Luma key, chroma key, pattern, and DVE. And we'll go through all of those in a minute. And then at the very top is your downstream key. And that's your topmost layer. And the downstream key, you have, um, you don't really have any options for it. It is a, it, you can choose what input to use as the key, but it, there's no, um, there's no other, like, you can't shift things around or, or resize things. So think of these as three layers. You've got you can choose what camera angle is selected. You can choose what you want as your graphic on that middle layer, and you can choose what you want on the top layer. So back to the uh, back to the software. Upstream key one gives you these four options: Luma, Chroma, Pattern, and DVE. So we're going to go through these one by one and show how these affect the result. Now I want to take a break and make a new super source layout so you can actually see the output of this with the software app on top. So I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is grab the program feed of, I'm going to grab the program feed of the ATEM. Uh, we're going to go back to that one and I'm going to build a super source layout in my extreme so that you can see the program output. So we get a little behind the scenes, scenes peek at this. Um, right now I'm using two boxes. I've got my face in box one, which I'm going to actually move up. And I'm going to change box two to shrink it a little bit and move that up and over. Can you still see that? Is that too small? Really what I want is no, actually, really what I want is I really only care about the sidebar right now. So what I'm going to do is instead, I'm going to go like that, uh, center it vertically, scoot it over here. All I really care about you looking at right now is the sidebar. So we're going to go ahead and crop the left side in by a bunch. And let's see, maybe 26 so that we can only see the sidebar. And let's get rid of the clock while we're at it. Okay. So lovely. Maybe we can make this full height. And scoot that over there. Great. Box one, we can why am I not centered? I think I'm sitting somewhere different than I was yesterday. So let's fix that with cropping. Uh, let's like go like that and then go like that and then scoot me back over a little bit there. And then in the middle, we're going to use box three, which is going to be the ATEM Mini Pro. And for this, this is the program out of, or the HDMI out of the ATEM Mini Pro. And uh, right now I've just got it on the still graphic, but for example, if I switch to my um, overhead shot, that way you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Let's make that a little bigger, a little bit smaller. 
Okay. How's that? We can make it a little bit bigger. So I'm this is <laughs> this is the awkward way to build super source layouts using black magic software. It's actually a lot easier using mix effect, but again, um, I just don't quite have things set up to do that. Um, now I need to capture this so I can restore to this layout. So I need to go recreate all of these settings in a companion button, which is, sorry, you can't see this now. Um, Oh, here's what I can do. Just switch to my computer screen. So you get to watch me copy the settings over from the software control. So I've got a button here, which is going to turn box one on, box two, box three are all on, box, box four is off. Um, box one is going to be set to my, um, my main camera, which is this. Box two is set to... Uh, Box two is set to the computer. Box three is set to the ATEM Mini Pro. Great. Now we need to copy over the crop settings. So size of this is 0.44. X is negative 12.65. Y is zero. Crop is enabled. Top is zero. Bottom is zero. Left is nine. And right is nine. All right. Moving on to box two. Box two is set to size one, X is negative 0.39, Y is 0.2, and then we do want to crop. Top is cropped by 0.48, the bottom is cropped by zero, the left is cropped by 26.35, and the right is not. Box three is uh, size 0.59, X is 0.2, Y is zero, crop is not enabled. And then we're going to wait 50 milliseconds and actually set super source on air. Set program input. And we don't want the downstream key. Oh, that was my little, um, no, we're gonna get rid of that. Okay. So when I press that button, this is an example of using companion to make a whole series of actions happen with one button. When I press that button, it should restore that layout. And then if I press a button to change my super source, there we go. Now I can hop between the two. Lovely. <laughs> Any questions about, about that? Yeah, the power of super source, uh, power of super source on the extreme is demonstrated right there. Exactly. Um, mix effect, is a good way to do that too, because what you can do with mix effect is um, you can tell it to write all of the current values of that whole panel into a macro, and then I could run the macro, but it didn't take that long. Whatever, we're fine. Okay, back to this. So what I can do now is actually show you, we'll hop back over to the ATEM Mini Pro or ISO, where did it go? There it is. And now we only, again, only have one upstream and one downstream. So now we're going to talk about the, all the upstream key options available in the ATEM Mini Pro. First, we're going to reset these to something reasonable and we're going to start at the top. So what you're seeing in the middle of my screen right now is the HDMI out from the A10 Mini Pro. So as I'm doing, uh, I can I can for example run a transition and show my main camera here, and I can show the side camera. Uh, but we're going to now play with the upstream key. So the upstream key again, think of it as that sort of um, that middle layer where it's it lets you put things on top of whatever is your main video. So for the, the my main camera is now set to the top down view and we can put stuff on top of it. And we can take any of our uh, sources, our inputs as the source of the Luma key. 
what might you actually want to do with this? Well, Luma Key is going to remove the darkest parts of the image. So essentially, it's most useful for bringing in uh, graphics where you have it on a black background. So um, do I have do I have any graphics with a black background ready? I think I might need to make one really quick. And um, so let me go into Photoshop. And we can go make a new graphic in Photoshop. So I'll make a full um, 1920 by 1080 graphic, which is your full resolution. And we're going to start with a black background instead of a white background. And then we can, um, maybe we can make a simple lower third. So we can go drag a little rectangle out and add a green rectangle. And then we can type in some text in white over top. So we'll do, we'll do that. And then uh, down below, we'll put my website, which let's make it a little bit smaller and maybe change the font to be not that bold. And um, maybe not, not all caps. There we go. And just for fun, what I also want to do is show you uh, transparency. So oops, other way. I'm going to make this fade out. And that's going to show you some of the limits of what we can do with the Luma key. So I've got a nice little gradient there, which ideally it would, you know, smoothly fade over, but we're going to see how, if that actually works. So I can export this as a PNG and let's just call this um, lower third one, put it in my downloads folder. And now we can pop back over here and drag it into the media pool. Um, downloads, lower third one, drag it into slot nine. You can see it's got a black background and then I'm going to drag it into the media player. So this is the first, I guess, little intro to um, how, oh, what's going on? Oh my gosh, why is it disconnecting? Something is stealing its connections. Um, what could it be? And now I'm loading the other, it reconnected to the extreme. This is not um, working well. What could be on my network stealing connections? Andre says, we're at the one and a half hour mark. This is going to be a long one. I warned you. Um, so I think we're hitting that five device limit. What, do, what, do I, what have I got connected? I've got my companion. I've got my software control. Let me quit mix effect on my phone to make sure it's not also grabbing connections. Do I have any other devices around here? I have those little buttons I was using with it. Um, you know what I might do is change its IP address on my network so that it stops stealing so that anything else that's on my network isn't is no longer stealing it. So um, I need to, in order to change the IP, I have to plug in a computer because you can't do that over the network, which makes sense. So I'm going to grab a USB cable and grab my laptop since I can't reach my Mac mini from here. And over here, I can open the setup app. That's my computer wakes up and realizes what it's done. Are your ATEM minis being confused by IP address assignment? So I've got a static IP assigned in the router. So when it when it does DHCP, it gets 
the same address um, every time. And all of my gear is set up that way and it's all normally totally fine. Um, so I don't really understand why this one is suddenly having a problem, but what I'm gonna do is just give it, I'm gonna configure it to use a static IP um, that I know is not assigned on my router that way. Uh, that way I, if anything had this configured, it's not going to auto reconnect to it. So that should, that should work. Let's go back into the software control and go to connection. And then this should now have, let's force connect to the new IP. Okay. Hopefully that doesn't keep happening. We'll find out. If it does, I'm gonna be really concerned. Uh, this one I normally use at, uh, at, at home, at the home studio. Uh, I normally have it running there and it's been completely, completely stable there. And I actually usually use it to run Lily's Oh My Dollar show, which, oh, by the way, um, I should drop her channel in because you should all go subscribe to her channel. These are the, um, I, I help her run her stream. And uh, she is so very close to a thousand subscribers and would very much like to hit a thousand subscribers uh, before the end of the year. So go subscribe. And uh, her streams are great. She talks about um, budgeting and planners are the main two categories right now. So uh, every week, Sunday, Sunday evenings. So sorry for all the European Europeans. It does not. It's not a good time for for you. It's like 5 p.m. here, which is like middle of the night over there. Uh, but if you're in Australia, you can definitely catch her show live on. I believe that would be Monday mornings. Anyway. That's a plug for her channel. Go subscribe. That'll make her very happy if she can get close to um, get get to a thousand this year. Okay. So the back to back to upstream keys. That's what we were talking about. So I'm on the I'm on the A10 Mini Pro ISO here, and I've got that new graphic I made and I'm going to drag them to the media player. So the way that the media stuff works here, you've got 20 slots where you can load in 20 graphics. The 20 graphics can be saved in the device and they will save across power cycles, which is again, a feature that's not in the original mini, only in the pro and the ISO. These get saved into the device and then you can have one active at a time. Active means in the media player. So the media player is over here um, where you can choose what do you want to show up over there and only one graphic can be active at a time. Um, the AT Mini Extreme has two media players. So that's another another difference here. So I can choose the graphic I just made in Photoshop with a black background. I do that with a black background intentionally to show you Luma Key. Um, we'll do this again later with a transparent background, which will give us a much better result. So for now, we have a black background uh, with the Luma key. The other way that um, I might do this is, where did my, the other way to, to do this again, because remember that the um, the fill source, like we're, we can choose media player one, but we can also choose any of the HDMI inputs, which means if you have some other device that's generating graphics, like for example, Keynote on an iPod Touch, which is a really cool trick. Um, you can generate graphics from from Keynote on an iPod, and then bring them in over HDMI, and that's another reason why you might have a black background. So we can do that in a second too. Um, I'll just leave that over here with the HDMI cable that I can plug in. So, okay, we've chosen. Media player one as the fill source, you can see it auto chose media player one key. There is no alpha channel in that graphic, so it doesn't matter. And then we're gonna leave mask off and leave this off for now and see how this actually looks. So going back to, um, so this is set as the upstream key. I can actually now press the on air button, which brings the up that key on air. So 
now you can see what uh, what it looks like. So if I take it off air, you see the camera, and if I take it on air, it covers it. Because again, it's that layer. Think of, think about those layers. The camera or whatever camera is selected is in the background, and I can you know change what's in the background. Um, the Luma, the the upstream key will sit on top of that, and now you can't see the camera at all because the Luma key is not set up properly. So I have a black background, which means I can remove the background with the up with the Luma key, and the clip and the gain are the two settings you want to change, and you basically just want to dial it in until the background disappears. So uh, if we go, oh, we need to actually make the key source the same graphic, and then we can go and adjust that until it appears. And now you can see it's sitting on top of the image. And again, I can change the image behind it and the upstream key stays there. This is what I mentioned by that gradient is not working very well. You can see I can choose, I'm basically choosing one point in the gradient of, of the brightness where it's a cutoff. So I can choose with the clip where you want that cutoff to be and then I'll make everything darker than that transparent. But that means I can't get a smooth gradient out of it. Um, if, for example, you, uh, if you had, let's see what we can do with Keynote. Um, so in Keynote, I can go make a similar, similar graphic. I can start with a black background here. I'll just show like the main title screen, the main slide. So Keynote is showing just um, Oh, there's no text. Um, I need text on here. So we can type in like presentation title. I'll just put my name. I'm very creative. So Okay, there's my little presentation. There it is. So I can plug this in to one of the inputs. Let's grab number two and replace that with Keynote. And now take a look at the um, take a look at the multi view of the A10. So this is my iPod, and if I go and press the play button, it'll go full screen. So now I've got again same idea, right? It's a it's a black background and white text. So if we go into the key settings and choose computer as the fill source and the key source important, then all of a sudden my name is now overlaid on the on the on the screen. And again, choosing changing the clip will adjust how much of the uh, like edges of the text are are being removed and being transparent, because there is going to be some anti aliasing happening. Like I can see on this, um, I can, I can see it here. There's a little bit of black outlines around the text because it's not black. It's actually dark gray. But if I adjust the clip, it'll get rid of some of that. Uh, but it's not totally smooth because we're using the Luma key. So that's Luma key. Um, if you did want to add a mask, that basically just will crop and avoid, um, just ignore whatever is cropped. So. Like if I take the left into uh, to let's see negative. Uh, where where was my where was my um, negative eight eight what are the number there we go eight so if, as I'm dragging the oh that's the top I thought I was doing the left that's why it wasn't working. <laughs> um. So if I change the left crop to, it's hard to just slide this. Let's just type in some numbers, negative 13. Yeah, so you can see it's starting to eat into the letters because it's just cropping off the sides. So if you end up with like, if you have extra, like your computer title bar or something that you can't hide, you can just crop it out of the upstream key. Um, okay, so that's the Luma key. Um, and the, the idea is it will remove anything that's darker than a certain amount and it is not going to give you the smooth gradients. Um, one of the other options is the chroma key. Uh, actually, before we move, 
do that. Let's take a look at the chat. Are there any questions about Luma keys? Keynote on an iPod, the ultimate presentation device. Yep. Okay. The, um, the chroma key feature. So we're going to, we're going to look at chroma key next. Chroma key is very similar to Luma key, except instead of removing everything that's darker than a certain color, it's going to remove everything that is similar to a different color, a certain color. Typically you'll be using this for green screening on uh, either like a person or graphics. Let me pull this green screen up really quick. So first big caveat, I have not lit this green screen very well. So this is not going to be a very good demonstration of chroma keying, but it will get the point across. So again, think of it, you got layers. We've got whatever's in the background here right now, it's my, uh, my, my overhead camera. We can choose what is the fill source, which is what is on that middle layer. We're gonna choose my main camera, which has that green background now. And it looks like I didn't pull it up high enough. We'll have to test, we'll test the crop feature for that. And then we get to, um, we can sample a color or just choose one, but I like using the sample feature. And basically this gives you a little, um, a little, you drag it around and you can pick a color from the, from the scene. So I can see that like, I'm finding a green that is on the background here. There's uh, the dark green and it kind of gets brighter towards my shirt. Then there's my actual shirt. Uh, we could chroma key the blue out of my shirt. We could chroma key the, the red out of my shirt. Um, but we're going to start with the green background and uh, maybe around there. And let's turn that on air. And sure enough, it's it's already working. So it's it's taken my here's my um, here's the whole scene. You see my green screen is not does not fill the frame, and it's not perfectly green. So when I change the background layer, it's now putting myself over the background layer. And we now can adjust everything about the key. So we've got foreground, which is choosing, you know, how much of the how much of that similar green do we want? Um, here's the sort of opposite end of it. Um, here's the key edge, which is how blurry do you want that to be? It looks decent there. This green is too similar to the background, so it's getting removed from my shirt as well. And then if you need to, um, if you end up with like some of the green reflecting back around the edges or something, you can use the spill and flare suppression to fix that. Um, and then uh, mask. So mask lets you again, just sort of crop everything in the, in the key. So the top, I can drag the top mask down until it hides that black bar at the top. I can take the left in even more until I get to where that green screen starts. And on the right, we might go 12, no, 11, no, 10. So there we go. So now it's looking better, except for my shirt. Uh, being keyed out as well. But I'm able to, able to now, this is that middle layer and I can put anything behind it and I'm in, sitting in that middle layer. So I can take, I can change, for example, the background to, let's um, grab my, my channel art into the media player and then I can switch the program to the uh, media player and now I'm sitting on top of my background or I can grab that that layer graphic. And we can talk about layers while I'm layered sandwich in the middle of it. And now I can do things like point to upstream key, input select, downstream key. Um, so that's your, that is your chroma key feature. Turn that off air. And are there any questions about, about that in the chat? Yeah, now the shirt will key out. Okay. So moving on to pattern. 
pattern key. This is, um, I actually really like using the circle one, but this is basically, I, oh, let me get rid of the green screen. And if you light your green screen better than I did, you will get a much better result. And you can probably actually not key this out and also effectively key out the green background. So, okay, let's talk about the pattern key. Again, you choose what source you want for that layer, we're gonna do main camera, and you choose what pattern. Uh, I have circle selected, and then it's uh, you can choose the size, you can choose whether you want it to be a circle or oval, and then position it, and then mask it. And start with mask, and then flying key. So this is not on yet. Uh, let's go ahead and turn it on air, and there it is. So here's the circle. I can choose the size of the circle. I can choose the position of the circle, which is going to move it up relative to the image. Let's make it look like, let's go a little bit bigger and a little bit down and a little bit over. Great. And then softness is how much of that you want to blur. I like it not super harsh, but let's do it like that. And now um, I don't need to mask, but if I did mask it again, it's just going to straight up crop whatever is that, that video source. Flying key is, is the sort of main reason I would use the, the pattern source. Flying key lets you move and scale. So it took that circle out of the middle and it's now shifted me and I can move myself over anywhere I want. Up, down, left, right, and I can go bigger or smaller. Oh, apparently those were not linked. So normally you'll have them linked and you can choose bigger or smaller and keep them the same size. Coincidentally, this is also um, the the only reason I can think to not link the two is actually um, if you have, if you're using an anamorphic lens, this was something that um, I promised Tom Buck I would show him this. So he did a stream the other day about um, using streaming with an anamorphic lens. So <laughs> Totally, totally unrelated discussion here really quick. Um, the anamor anamorphic lens is what you, what you, you know, you see it in the, in films all the time, movies all the time, where you get like the nice streaky, horizontal streak lens flares. And uh, what it's doing is it's actually completely distorting the image that the camera sees. And it ends up looking like on your camera as a super tall, everything is tall and skinny. Um, I don't actually own like a real anamorphic lens. Uh, but I did just for fun, got a tiny one for my phone so that I could show this. And since we're talking about upstream keys, I guess this is as good a time as any to, to talk about this. So, um, I'm going to put this on my phone, hopefully on the right camera and, and then show you, um, show you what this does. So first of all, yeah, that looks right. I need to airplay my phone over to my Apple TV so you can see it. So, yeah, that's that's appropriately weird looking. Um, so I've got the little anamorphic adapter on it, and uh, this is now what you are. See this is what the phone is seeing. So if I look at myself, I look very distorted. I'm also not exposed well. Um, I should be able to change the exposure in here a little bit. Let's see. Let's go. Let's go down a notch. That looks a little better. Okay. So I look super distorted and I would like to unsquish myself. And most of the ATEM cannot do that. Most of the stuff in the ATEM can't actually um, mess with video. So what I can do though is, um, so oh, wait, that's the ATEM program. I want to show you this. I need to send my, I need to send my Apple TV over to the ATEM. So I'm going to go and do that one should get the Apple TV feed. Oops. That was not the right one. 
No, I can't see myself. Was it uh, G? Oh, yeah, of course. I. Uh, overhead. We're going to replace the... No, we're going to replace that one with the Apple TV. There we go. Okay, I've got the Apple TV coming into the ATEM Mini now. So now what I can do is fix the fix the distortion here. So um, let's show you the get rid of the upstream key. Here is the feed from the iPhone in anamorphic mode. So the picture looks stretched because that's what the anamorphic lens does. And what we have to do is squish it back down. And that's why you end up seeing, you know, black bars on the top of pictures of, of movies and stuff. Um, but we need to squish it so that it doesn't look distorted anymore. And that's normally you can't do that with most of the stuff in the ATEM, except for with the upstream key. The upstream key is the only thing that lets you do that. So what we can do here is we're going to switch to a, um, a black or a color background instead of actually, let's just make it black, black background for a base layer. We don't have any video on that bottom layer. We only have the, the black color. And then we're going to, oh no. Okay. It just did it again. So something is wrong with, something is wrong with my network here. Reconnect. Okay, there we go. We can use the DVE, is probably the right way to do this, to actually squish this picture. So again, DVE is one of the other upstream key options. We can choose what image to use, which I had. I have it coming in as the uh, input three, which is now inappropriately called side. We're going to reset the position of this to just be in the center and full, full size, and then we'll turn on the upstream key. So now it looks like it's not doing anything. What we can do is now as we change the size, we can shrink it, right? But if you unlink it, you can change the Y independently. So I want X to be one. This is a 1.3 anamorphic lens. So uh, one over 1.3 is uh, 0.75. So if we set the Y to 0.75, that should look about right. And now we've de-squeezed the anamorphic lens and it looks more or less correct. And we've now got the black bars on the top and bottom because that's, it's still being presented in 1920 by 1080. So that is how you do, that's how you can use an anamorphic lens with the A10 mini um, using your upstream key. And now if I shine lights on here, you get the pretty, streaky streaky blue horizontal lens flares um so yeah that is fun that is very fun there you go tom that is for you now you know how to do it with an a10 mini pro okay let's get rid of this nonsense Another reason you might want the A10 Mini Extreme is because that uses one of the upstream keys, and with the A10 Mini Extreme, you have four of them available. Okay, getting that back to the side camera and um, unshare my iPhone screen. Great. Any, any questions about that? Uh, Photo Joseph talked about anamorphic lenses on a stream, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think he did just do a video about that. Um, let's see if I can find that. Oh yeah, it was like um, it was like a month ago. He was he used real anamorphic lenses for that, not just the little iPhone one. So. Uh, here is the link to his video, which looks like that. Um, he had a bunch of the lenses pulled out to look through, which was fun. Uh, good, very good video. Okay. The, 
despite the keying out of your shirt, chroma works quite well relative to other keyers. Yes, um, I agree. The chroma key on the ATEM Mini actually uh, has been significantly upgraded compared to the other older ATEMs. So it is quite powerful. It is surprisingly good. Sanford says, I know you're using the Mini Pro to source the middle, but can you use a chroma key in the Extreme is one box? Me with the background and box to my slide. Um, so the, if you, if you have the extreme, then what I would do is actually use super source for that, which is how I'm building this layout, which is basically what you're talking about, right? Where if you want, um, if you want the, a slide, like from your computer, this is my computer screen, but it could be, uh, some other, whatever, anything else, um, that's box two, and then this view of me is box one. And super source is like a more powerful version of uh, the layout engine, the DBE layout engine. So it lets you crop and scale each, like four different boxes. So I'm only using two boxes for this layout. Um, and then whatever, the background can be anything else. It can be an image or it can be a video. Um, right now I just have it set to, to be an image. But it can also be an animated background if you have a video playback coming in. So I would use SuperSource to do that layout that you're talking about. You can do it with upstream keys. And because the ATM Mini Extreme has four upstream keyers, you can do it with the upstream key, um, the, the DVE option. So like here, I can just show you really quick. Uh, if we go over to my Extreme, I'm using SuperSource, but I still have four upstream keys available. So if I switch over to DVE, I can then actually bring that on the air and scale that down and move it put that put that somewhere i can also um i can also do the same with with upstream key two i can show you like let's do the overhead camera and uh turn that on and then maybe shrink it and move it over there so the point i'm making here is that Super source is like the sort of a better way to get to create this layout, but you could also use your four upstream keys to get, uh, or apparently only two of them can be on at a time um, because I'm using super source. I remember that from last time I tried this. Um, if I change away from super source, then I can bring, nope, why can't I bring those two on? There's a trick, there's a, there's a trick. Is it? Oh, I remember what it is. There are only two DVEs supported in the extreme. So uh, back to my super source. I can use a pattern upstream key as the third one, but I can't use three DVEs. So you get uh, pattern and Luma work. Uh, no, Luma does not work. Pattern three. Okay, there's some other weird limits going on here. I can't tell what it is. That fourth one I can't bring on when it's set to pattern. Oh, it's because I'm using super source again. Right? No? Okay, I'm finding some weird limits of the extreme I didn't know about. Um, anyway. This is just another good example of why SuperSource is a better solution for that. SuperSource gives you the four boxes and you can um, put anything you want in each box and move them all around independently. And we'll get rid of those. Okay, back to the mini. Oh, thank you, Peter. I found a couple of live stream videos on YouTube with 25 frames per second done with A10 Mini, but I can't manage to do that. The stream always will be 1080p 30. Do you know a solution for that? Oh, good question. Um, the uh, Let's actually talk about that really quick. So one of the other sort of setup things I haven't talked about yet is the... Um, all the frame rate options available in the in the ATEM. So 
here I'm on the, the, the ATEM software control app. This is also a really confusing thing. There are two different places that there are settings. Preferences is like for the app. I never go into this. The gear down here is the actual settings for the ATEM. So this is where you can change your labels. So they all start out as like camera one, camera two, but I like to name them something. So I've chosen main, main camera, computer side, um, and overhead. Uh, you can name your outputs too, but I don't ever change those. This is also where you can set up your multi-view. So you can actually change uh, some things about the multi-view on the, on the mini. The extreme has much more flexible multi-view options, but you can choose whether you want your audio bars to show up. So if you look at the, if you look at the multi-view of this, um, I can turn on audio meters for each input or on my program or, um, and now since I don't have any audio turned on, yeah. So if I turn on the, on input four, you can see it's the built-in mic from the overhead camera is what's what you're seeing the levels of. Um, and then the, uh, audio tab is where you can choose all the different, um, whether you want your mic or line level and we'll choose mic level for that. Uh, split is whether you want to treat a stereo as separate channels, which is a useful feature. But you were talking about video standards. So the ATEM has the option of changing what frame rate internally is being used. And I usually leave mine in 2997, but you can change it to other frame rates. It does, um, it'll like sort of do a power cycle really quick if you change it. So I'm not gonna change it right now. Um, but if you change it to 25, you can, you, you, it, everything internally will be working at that frame rate. So all of the sources will get synced to that frame rate and the stream it produces will be at that frame rate. So what you were saying though, is that, um, the YouTube. So if I remember correctly, uh, oh, we're going to also, um, do a quick demo for uh, whoever that was that asked about demoing uh, how to create a, an event on YouTube. So on YouTube, when you go create a live stream, this is my process for uh, more or less for creating these lives. You click the little go live in YouTube studio and it's going to, it takes a long time to load and then it's going to load up my current list of live streams. I usually do a scheduled stream. So you can either reuse settings from a previous stream. So I can go back to like, here's my, it'll copy the description and thumbnail from um, a previous stream, or you can start from scratch. So I'll go ahead and reuse. It's going to pull everything in from before. Um, I'm going to delete that video ID until I, uh, until I make it. And then here's like my, you know, the last description I used, I'll go and delete the timestamps and then uh, leave everything else in there. Great. Next, we'll turn on monetization, and then we will um, allow live chat and all that kind of stuff. Gonna skip all the other stuff. And then visibility, I would make it public, but I'm not going to, because I don't want it to blast out on everybody's feeds. I'll just make this one unlisted. And this is gonna then create that placeholder. So this would then show up on my YouTube page as uh, I have the upcoming live stream section turned on. So it'll show the scheduled ones, and then now I'm dropped into the studio. So the, uh, oh, it's receiving, it's receiving video from the stream keys because this is my same stream key that's actually streaming right now. Um, you can choose the latency. I usually leave an ultra low, which is how I can very quickly be interacting with everybody on the stream because it only is a couple seconds delayed. Uh, but it does not do closed captions. So if I had chosen low latency, for example, then YouTube's auto captioning would actually work, which is, which is good. Um, yeah, duplicate stream key detected. So we want to select a different stream key. Um, and then, uh, this is where you get to choose your frame rates. So we're gonna make a new stream key. Uh, we're gonna call this uh, test stream key. So I remember to delete, delete it later. We are gonna choose RTMP. And then we're going to choose manual settings. And th these are the options you get. Um, you can choose your resolution. So for the ATEM, I'm obviously going to choose 1080 because I can't 
choose, I don't have 4K output from the ATEM, I don't have 1440. Other software like OBS or Ecamm can output in those. Um, but I'm going to choose 1080 for the ATEM. And then you don't get to choose the frame rate other than, I guess it's 30 by default or 60 if you want. Um, so with this option, viewers can select 60, but I don't, there are no other options. So I don't think YouTube will let you stream at actually 25. Um, so I do that. I choose the stream key. I've got it here. I copy this and go bring it into the ATEM software. So let's go ahead and do that. Copy this in the ATEM software control. Um, we can go start a new live stream and then choose YouTube from this list and then paste the stream key in. I don't care that you saw it because it's not doing anything yet. And um, then you just press on air or press the on air button on the device. And doing that, we should see it pop up here really quick. Um, it should say excellent connection. And then for some reason, a couple seconds later, this go live button will turn blue once it's had a chance to think about things. And uh, then you're ready to go live. So, okay, I mentioned this is scheduled. Uh, so I would, I would have chosen the actual date I want to go live. Choosing the date in YouTube has actually nothing to do with any, any automatic anything. So if I've chosen 12, 10 PM, I can go live earlier or later. Like nothing happens automatically. This, all this does is it just shows you on the screen when it's going to start. So if you look at the stream right now, we're not live. And if you look at it, it says waiting because it's now past 12, 10 and it was supposed to start two minutes ago. So it says waiting for Aaron. Um, if it was scheduled in the future, it'll say like starting soon at 12, 10. And the, um, but yeah, nothing happens automatically. The only thing that that date does is just shows when that's going to happen. You can start the stream earlier and you can start the stream later. So what I usually do is, um, I schedule it with the time that I'm planning on starting the content. So 10 AM Pacific, and then 10 minutes before that, I will press go live with the countdown timer and uh, that way, if people are jumping on it from, from their calendar reminders or whatever it is, they are dropped into a video. But again, nothing happens until you press go live. So go live will then actually start the stream. Um, oh yeah, auto start, auto stop. I always leave these turned off because I uh, don't want to one accidentally start a stream. And I also want to make sure that if the ATEM loses its internet connection for some reason, the stream doesn't actually end. Once you end a YouTube live stream, it's ended for good. It's gone. You cannot restart it. So we can go live on this. And this is now, this video is now on my channel. It is live at this, at this link and uh, we are streaming to it. And if I cut the ATEM and stop streaming, we'll see this picture freeze. We'll freeze in a second. There it goes. Uh, oh wait, it's still running. Where is it? It should stop. There it is. Spinner is happening. It's not receiving any data. The ATEM is off the air, but because auto stop is not selected, anybody who's watching this stream, they're still looking at this buffering screen. So they're not getting kicked off. They're not told the stream is ended. Um, it's playing the last couple seconds. There it goes. And they're just going to be stuck here until I push new data. And I can use this to do a couple of things. I can, um, I can recover from an outage by giving my ATEM a new internet connection and then restarting the stream. So if I press, let's cut over to the main camera and then press on air. Now the ATEM is pushing to YouTube again. So in a couple seconds, this should pop up again. There we go. Um, I think it dropped down to 240. Yeah, it's dropped down low resolution because the player thought that, um, the, the connection was slow. Uh, you can see that I've got 1080p 60 as the option, even though I'm not even generating this, this at 60 frames a second, but YouTube thinks it is. So, um, yeah, what I, this gives me the opportunity to like with the auto stop, not selected. It means that if my feed drops for some reason, I can switch internet connections, go tether on my phone, or I can, um, 
reboot my router or whatever it is and then resume the stream and the what happens in the replay is it's completely seamless so uh you don't see a gap but live obviously you see this this sort of loading screen until the video feed comes back um interesting trick is you can actually also um push data from a different device so this is the stream key is loaded on this atem but I could also then take a YOLO box, plug in the same stream key, stop streaming from the ATEM, start streaming from the YOLO box, and it'll push to the same YouTube video. And it will work. And I actually used that um, to my advantage last year when I was uh, streaming and the power went out in the studio and everything shut down, but I still had battery and a camera and a YOLO box on battery and a cell phone on battery. And I was able to keep the stream going by just cutting over and resuming the stream on from the YOLO box. And then everything looked like it was, it was on the same video and people didn't have to like go figure out a new link or anything. So that was a nice little, a nice little trick that came in really handy. Um, okay. So then when you actually want to end and you actually want to end, I would recommend pressing the end stream button on YouTube because that will actually end the video. And if you press end stream and your ATEM is still streaming to it, you can push video to YouTube all day long and it's going into a void. It is being pushed to this stream key, which is not being rebroadcast anywhere, if that makes sense. So YouTube is still receiving data from my ATEM. I'm wasting bandwidth. So I should then shut off my ATEM. Okay. That was a little detour um, about how I use YouTube, how I stream and manage stream keys and all the YouTube settings. Um, the frame rate though um issue is that yeah youtube is set to 30 frames per second um okay back to the questions uh what questions what questions have we got here What's the maximum bitrate on the ATEM Mini Pro when streaming? Good question. Let's talk about the streaming op the streaming bitrate options. Um, so in the ATEM software, again back in uh, back in the ATEM software, in the streaming section you get this little quality selector, and you can stream any of these settings. These are the built-in ones. Um, what this does is this changes the bitrate of the H.264 encoder. And this is uh, one little weird thing about the about the ATEM. There is one encoder for uh, the the H.264 encoder in the ATEM, and it does it can do two things. It can stream that output from the encoder, or it can record that output to disk. So whatever you've chosen here will affect both of those. If you choose HyperDeck High, which I don't really know why it's called HyperDeck High, but it's 70 megabits a second. Um, that will change the encoding bitrate of the H.264 encoder, and it means that's what you are recording to a drive, but you can also stream that to YouTube. I can tell you from experience, YouTube is not happy about it. If you do that, let's go actually try that really quick. We're gonna go and make a new live stream in YouTube and we can go schedule a stream um, streamed. Yeah, we'll reuse that one because it'll copy the stream key. Um, I'm going to make sure it's unlisted. And then it should have that same stream key selected. Yeah, test key. So because I've chosen HyperDeck High, the encoder gets switched into 70 megabits. And if I press on air, it's going to push 70 megabits to YouTube, which is a little bit outrageous. Hopefully that doesn't break my bandwidth. I should have enough bandwidth for that to keep the mainstream going too. Um, YouTube is going to say, cool, we got some video. And then it's going to start complaining. Um, it should start complaining pretty quick that this bit rate is way higher than it should be. Um, if you look at the multi-view of the ATEM, um, it's, the ATEM is a variable bit rate encoder, so it will only use as much as it needs to. So for example, if I switch to a still graphic, oops, I hit the fade to black button instead of the auto button. If I switch to a still graphic, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth to encode a still picture that is not moving. So you can see the bit rate is dropping. 
because there isn't any need to waste data on uh, encoding a, a static graphic. So it's now sending a 0.19 megabit a second stream. And if we cut back to the camera, it's going to shoot back up to as much as it needs to to encode this picture. This picture is relatively simple to encode because this background is so, um, it's relatively flat. There's not a lot of detail in it. If I switch to, so we're hovering around what, 37, 36? Um, if I switch to this one, there's a lot more detail in there and a lot more things are moving because there's so many copies of me that this should take more bandwidth to encode and we should maybe see this jump up. Maybe maybe there's still not enough detail in here to, to cause it to jump. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. It's a variable bitrate encoder and um, it's going to use as much as it needs to. So um, YouTube will accept a feed at this bitrate, but it will not be happy about it and it might fall over. Um, it'll, you might see buffering on YouTube because it's, it's encoder, it's trying to transcode it to a reasonable bitrate and it's failing, but you can push that. Um, you can go into your software control and change to, um, change to streaming high, which is the highest recommended for YouTube, which is gonna push, um, I believe nine megabits and there isn't really any reason to go much more than that in practice. Um, you aren't going to get that much more detail out of it. Um, the, the, okay, other questions from, yeah. So max bit rate for recording and streaming um, using the Mini Pro and the ISO. The ISO and the Pro have, are the same other than the ISO recordings features. So. Um, the maximum bit rate, again, there's that one H.264 encoder and the bit rates are, uh, the streaming high is nine megabits and the, um, recording hyperduck high is 70. Oh, I remember why it wasn't 70. It's the frame rate issue. Um, my ATEM is set to 30 frames a second. If I change it into 60 frames a second, it needs, it actually will go up to 70 megabits because it's got double frames. Um, that's why it was capping out around 35. Um, the, the difference with the ISO model, so there's one streaming encoder in the, um, in the non-ISO model, and whatever you choose here will affect the, out, the stream output as well as the recorded output. In the ISO model, it will record all four inputs onto the drive as well. And those are always recorded at the top quality. You do not get to change those. Those are always recorded at effectively hyperdeck high. So your four cameras get recorded as 70 megabit or 35 megabit recordings on disk. And then separately from that, you get a fifth recording, which is your program out, which is whatever you've chosen in this menu. So if you want to get the highest quality recording of everything ever, choose hyperdeck high here, and then all five recordings will be the same. Or if you're going to be streaming the program, choose streaming high, and then um, your ISO recordings, the individual cameras are set to 70 megabits or 35 megabits, and your streaming encoder will be dropped down, and your program out recording will be dropped down. Can you start or stop a stream, for example, from Companion? Um, yes. So let's go do that really quick. Let's go to my Companion. Um, and where's my little page here? So I mentioned, um, these are the buttons we made in Companion earlier. Uh, we've now looked at a bunch of other features in the ATEM, so we can go make some new buttons that do things. So for example, um, we can make a pre-roll button, which is usually what I like to do for setting up a show. And that's going to set um, media, where's my ATEM mini ISO media player set source. We'll set it to, the channel art, and then we can say program is the media player one. So that's going to put my channel art on the screen. And then let's say um, mute audio. Uh, Fairlight, I, AT Mini ISO set, these, na these names are awkward, set input mix option. And let's say we're using the analog input mic one for the audio, so we would turn that off. So I have a pre-roll button that's going to put up the graphic, mute the audio, 
and uh, also make sure that the right graphic is chosen. And then here we're going to make a start show or let's see start stream let's do that here so for this we're going to go into the iso and there should be an action which is streaming yeah streaming start or stop you can also actually set the stream key in companion if you wanted to um so atem mini iso start streaming and then here we're going to do uh start show which is then going to preview. Um, it's going to put the main camera into the preview, and then it's going to uh, input mix. It's going to turn on the mic one, and then we're going to do the auto transition to, it's like pressing the auto button, and we're going to wait 100 milliseconds for that. So. What this does is, um, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the, unfortunately, I don't have a good way to show you these buttons. Oh, I know what I can do. I can launch the emulator. No, I can launch the web buttons and make it really small. And then, oh no, it was on page 50. Can I just say page 50? Yes, I can. Okay, so we can do that. And then if I go and jump to this layout, you can watch me press the buttons. So we're looking at the multi view. So as I press the pre roll button, oh, it's not connected. I'm reconnecting. That's why they're all yellow. Oh, I changed the IP address. That's why. <laughs> um change go back into companion and change the ip address for that connection there we go okay so now the buttons don't have the little icon saying it's broken so when i press pre-roll it's going to load that graphic into the media player put it on the program mute the input one which is let's actually turn that mic on so we can see the levels bouncing around um do we see there we go my i can see the levels happening coming in on mic one yeah that look, looks good as i'm talking um that actually looks a little bit loud let me turn that down okay and uh then i will press the start stream button which is actually going to push to youtube and you can see it went on air and then i will run the start show button which will um switch the camera that's on preview to be this main camera and then run the auto transition which will do the, the the fade so when i when i'm ready to start the stream at the top of the hour i'll press start show and now we're live so if i um let's let's do it again but let's not look at the multi-view so this is what it looked like live it would be this graphic um I, hopefully i'll have a countdown timer over the top as well which there's many ways to do but you can bring it in through an ipod a timer on an ipod for example um, start the stream, start streaming to YouTube, go live on YouTube with your pre-roll graphic, and then start the show. It does the fade in and turns the audio on. And we're live. So that's the typical sequence I would use. And if you look at my actual companion buttons on my uh, that I use for this show, that's what I've got here. Pre-roll, which does that series of things, plus a few other fancy things, because I have a lot more parts to the show than just just those three layers um map is when i switch over to show the map live um and then i have two different start buttons because when i start a show here i need to turn on different microphone cut to a different camera starting at the desk i turn on a different mic different camera um and that's how i usually start the show um oh han says sorry i meant start and stop the youtube stream um no. So the um, YouTube has to, you have to use the website for that. So there's no button in here that, or like API that you can use. So uh, you do have to go here and press go live. If you wanted to be able to have this start and stop automatically, then you could use the auto start, but that's where you get into really risky behavior because um, 
as soon as whatever stream key is selected starts receiving data, this video will go live. And what that means is like, um, it would be a complete disaster for it this week because as you can see, I have um, a whole bunch of videos queued up, ready to go. And they're all using the same stream key because I'm only gonna be doing one at a time, but um, I don't even know what would happen if they were set to auto start and uh, I started pushing to a stream key. They might actually all go live, which would be kind of weird. Uh, that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> so I don't, I do not use the auto start. I don't want to run that risk of accidentally starting a YouTube video for reals. All right. Uh, last question or another question about the scheduling. When you schedule an unlisted YouTube live stream, do your subscribers receive an email notification? Um, no. So let me first talk about just like the regular YouTube notifications. Um, YouTube notifications are a nightmare of inconsistency. If you, if you click the little bell icon on a video, so if you're looking at like an upcoming live stream and you click the little, um, oh, I can't, oh yeah, there it is. The set reminder button. You might get a notification from YouTube, but you also might not. Um, it, they do tend to work better when you click it for a specific live stream. Uh, if you are looking at someone's channel and um, click this bell, it is not all. Despite what YouTube is saying, it is definitely not going to send you all notifications of activity from this person. Um, it What it does is it tells YouTube that you are more interested in notifications and they will give you some of them. So um, I have found that the notifications of specific live streams are more consistent than the bell notifications, but still it's nowhere near consistent enough for me. Um, so what I did separately from that was I made an email list where if you go to my website and scroll down at the bottom, there's an email sign up, and it's my own email list that I run that I have written special code that goes and when there's a public live stream scheduled 30 minutes ahead of time, it will blast out an email. So I've been sending out so many emails this week. I hope I don't make my email provider angry. Um, but that only runs for public, not unlisted live streams. Okay. So where were we? Popping back to, let me stop that stream. Popping back to what we were, where were we? We were talking about upstream key. That's what we did. Talked about upstream keys. We need to talk about downstream keys. Thankfully, this is gonna be a much shorter one. So, okay, back to this. So base layer, oh, I should do my little stinger. Talking about downstream keys next. Input select is that base layer. That's what do you want to be on the bottom? Upstream key, we can insert something into the middle and you can remove or you can remove video either by cropping or chroma keying or luma keying. Uh, you can slide it around and scale it with DVE. Downstream key is the very top layer and it's much, much, much more limited. Um, if you look at the options available in the downstream key menu, there are, uh, you choose what source to use as a downstream key. You can mask it, so that's cropping, and then you can choose pre-multiplied or not. There's no scale, there's no position, and there's no choosing whether Luma or Chroma. It's effectively always a uh, Luma key. So let's take a look at what I've got in the media player. We'll use this as an example again. Lower third, remember this has a black background, so um, the other way to other way to do this is to look at my, or is to use my um, iPod as the input with which has just my name in white letters. So we can do we can do an example with both. Um, so the background layer, let's switch it to the um, let's switch it to the side view. My background layer is a side view, and in the downstream key settings, I can use the media player one, which is now my little lower third with a gradient background, which is going to not work super great. Um, no mask because it is a full image. The, everything's on it the way I want. Um, we're going to go ahead and just press on air and you can see it completely covered everything up because it's not properly Luma keying. 
So that's because pre-multiplying key is set and there is no alpha channel available in the image. If we go to media player one, it's going to do something interesting. <laughs> uh, when the fill and key source are both set to media player one, pre-multiply key is going to give you weird results and it's not really going to do what you want. So don't check that unless you want the sort of gradient effect, but it's not, it'll, the gradient will look different based on the colors in your image. So it's not really going to be super consistent. Um, but this is normally you would for a static image with no transparency, you would just use regular clip and adjust the clip to choose what level of black do you want to be treated as transparent. And, um, that's why that gradient is not a gradient because it's picking a line, drawing a line and everything below that in darkness is transparent. If I switch over to the computer, which is my keynote presentation, you can see it's doing the same thing again, where if I have this set to low, it'll um, either not remove any of the darkness or it will leave some um, black fuzzies around the edge. So you want to choose a value where it starts to look better. If you go too high, it's going to remove some of the actual letters. So adjust that till it looks right. And that's looking fine. Um, this is, um, and that's coming in over the iPod. So, you know, as I'm switching slides on the iPod, I can change the, the text that appears in the downstream key. Um, again, there's no ability to, to scale or resize or move. So you need to make sure that your graphics are created in the correct position. So if you wanted this to be a lower third, it has to be actually a lower third in, in your source graphic. So like if I go to Photoshop, wherever you have this set in your 1920 by 1080 is where it's going to show up on the screen. And if your image is not 1920, 1920, 1080, it's going to scale it. So like if I switched my lower third to this, which is like a 200 pixel image, it's made it full size and it's going to be super grainy, which is not good. So, um, I'm going to switch over to that one, or in reality, I would not have a gradient because the gradient doesn't look good. And I would use something like that and then switch over to the media player one. And that is looking fine now because there's no gradient. So how do you actually get a proper gradient though? That's what we want to know. Back to Photoshop. If I get rid of my background and actually have uh, Photoshop use a transparent background instead of a black background, if Photoshop has a transparent background and I export this PNG, it will export an alpha channel into that image. So the best way to do this is if you install, uh, if you install that Blackmagic software on this computer that's running Photoshop, you get a new option in Photoshop, which is export to the ATEM switcher media pool. This lets you type in the IP address of your ATEM and this will connect and it'll eat up one of those five connections. And then we'll say uh, lower third transparent. And then let's choose an empty slot. And then you can choose pre multiply alpha. This is going to do the right thing. It is very complicated to explain what pre multiply actually means. And I don't think it's actually worth it to explain the details. There's a lot of math involved and I cannot do a good enough job to explain how that actually works. What you really need to know is if you have a graphic created in Photoshop with transparency, the best way to get the best result in the ATEM is to export it from Photoshop using this plugin and check that pre-multiply alpha box. Run export. Now we pop over to the ATEM media pool and here it is, lower third transparent. It looks like it has a black background in the preview just because they don't put anything in the background when it's transparent, but watch what happens. We'll drag it into the player lower third transparent. And now if we go into the downstream key, let's go back to the view so you can see everything. Um, fill source and key source are media player one. So it's still using only the image data. But if we choose instead of media player one as the key source, we choose media player one key, which is the alpha channel. Still not quite doing the right thing because we need to check this box. If we check pre multiplied key and we gave it a pre multiplied graphic, then it actually does the right thing. And now we've got the proper transparency, nice smooth gradient of that lower third from Photoshop. 
That's the best way to get your lower thirds with a real alpha channel into the ATEM. And I think that wraps it up for downstream key. So any other questions about downstream keys? Any other downstream key questions? No. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I've noticed that YouTube streams for publicly scheduled, and YouTube notifications for publicly scheduled streams are inconsistent. Yes. A nightmare. Um, any idea who makes the color card? Yes. Let's see if I have a link for that. Um, it is, I'm trying to remember the full name. It's got a very long name. Um, there we go. Okay. It is the x ray Color Checker Passport Video. Let me grab that link. I uh, found it in other stores, B&H, Adorama, wonderful. Um, cool. X-Rite, color checker, passport, video. So yeah, this is the, uh, this is the little color chart. Hopefully my colors are right. Um, I have learned that I do not like colors. I do not like dealing with colors. It is, it hurts my head and I hate it. So. Um, I've made a lot for this camera with some help to make it look the way I want it to and look more or less matches my Lumix G7s. And I have never really touched anything since then. I used a color chart to make that, so um, that was very helpful. Resolve has tools that work with this that you can sort of automatically correct colors, which um, are helpful also. But now it pretty much just lives on my desk because it looks fun. Um, oh, Andre is pointing out another option is to create a proper Targa file in Photoshop. Good point. So, um, if you export this as a ping with transparency and import it into the Blackmagic media pool, it's not going to actually do the right thing. Um, and it won't do exactly what you want. But if you do export as, oh, not export as, um, save as. Save as Targa. This should do the right thing. Let's see. Um, lower third with transparency. Save that as a copy. And then let's see if we can drag that into the media pool. Ah, look at that. It's got a white background. That's interesting. Hopefully this works. Um, I'm going to drag it into the just onto the media player and see if that swaps out nicely. It did not. That's interesting. I don't know why that should have worked. Well, I have never used that option before, so that's why I export from the plugin in Photoshop. Um, I don't know why the alpha channel didn't get saved. Maybe I forgot an option when I was exporting. Oh, I probably did. There's a, um, Oh, why is there no um, alpha channel checkbox is not selected? That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. That's why I do the. That's why I use the plugin from Photoshop because it always does the right thing. Okay. Um, Andre says you may need to add an actual alpha channel though. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> that's why I just use the Photoshop export. Uh, Brian, sorry for being late. Had to build a Lego train for my sons. More complicated than an ATEM. Andre says there is a workflow for this, but it will take some time. Well, great. We don't have time because we're already two hours and 45 minutes into this and nearing the end, but no, we're not close to the end. Uh, Patrick says at a certain point, I didn't have the ATEM export option in Photoshop anymore. I have noticed this. Um, 
I think what happens is if Photoshop updates and installs a new version, it doesn't uh, bring the plugin with it. So if it disappears, reinstall the Blackmagic software after Photoshop updates, and that should bring it back. Um, how do you create a video GIF loop for a Stinger logo? Um, and greetings from Phoenix. Thank you for joining. Um, so the A10 Mini Pro, or and the Extreme actually, both models, um, do not have any form of video playback capability whatsoever. None. Um, there are more expensive ATEMs that have some video playback capability specifically for stingers, for animated stingers. Don't think of it as video playback. Think of it as like short animations. Uh, but the ATEM Mini Pro and the ISO and the Extremes have none of that at all. So um, what you have to do for any animations that you want to show in the ATEM Mini Pro is you have to do those in one of the HDMI inputs. So you can make a video file play on a HyperDeck. You could play video out of, um, actually Keynote is a really good trick for doing video animated playback of graphics, um, is creating a Keynote file with animation in it and then putting it on an iPod, for example, um, which is actually how I'm doing the, um, that's how I have the little ad thing. So uh, this little sidebar, you see how it's animated. This is actually being played right now off of another iPod Touch over there. And it's coming into my, my ATEM over one of the HDMI inputs. It's cropped, cropped that way. Uh, so that you're only seeing a sliver of it. And that Keynote file just sits there playing on an infinite loop off of that iPod. And I can, you know, bring it on air. I think it's in one of the downstream keys right now, if I remember correctly. Um, I can, I can check, but I think I'm using the downstream key and then I'm just cropping it, cropping it um, so that you're only seeing that sliver of the video. The keynote file is a full size uh, keynote project. I'm just then, I only have content over in that little side of it. Um, if we go look at my um, computer, I, I can just open it up. It's called pre-show loop and, um, oh dear. Oh, it starts playing it because that's how this file is set. Um, this is, this is the project. Uh, you can see that there are six slides and sometimes I have graphics that spill out over that sidebar, but I crop it in the ATEM. And then, um, the trick here is the document is set to autoplay and loop and self playing with no delays. And then every slide has animations. So every slide has like this one, um, this one is set to move, right? So we've got a move animation for 15 seconds. So, and this one's actually just a video embedded that plays. And uh, all of these things have different like move actions or uh, this one has the little, each of these has a little pulse action. And um, that's how it does that. And then this just sits there on the iPod playing and that's how I get animated graphics in um, in my shows, which is, I think a nice little trick and um, an iPod is surprisingly affordable and um, good way to do that kind of basic, basic animations. But yeah, the uh, basically any way you can think of to get some video feed into an HDMI, you can then use it in the ATEM. Um, but there's no video supported in the ATEM directly. Um, Patrick says, confirm, just reinstall the ATEM control software and now the plugin shows in Photoshop. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Downstream key, we wrap that up. So, um, going through my checklist here. We talked about, oh, we haven't talked about audio at all. We need to talk about audio. We talked about buttons. We talked about, um, talked about buttons, switcher control apps, picture in picture, uh, upstream key, downstream key. Uh, one other physical control thing I do want to talk about. These buttons are on the side here. Um, these are the 
uh, these are the, it's called the video out section. And this affects what comes out over the HDMI port. Again, there's one HDMI on the ATEM and the HDMI is uh, for multi-view or in this case, what I'm seeing is the program. So these buttons choose what's go what goes out over HDMI. So most of the time I have it set to multi-view because I want to see the multi-view. However, um, you can also highlight one camera if you want to like check your focus and see the image bigger, or you can set it to program out so you can see the mix, or if you're outputting to a recorder, you can do it that way. You can also change this from the software app. So if we go back to the other ATEM, um, where is it? It is here. Then there's this output menu on the top. And again, we've got most of the same options to see the four cameras, multi-view program. We can also set it to preview, which is very not useful on the ATEM Mini Pro, but it makes more sense on the extreme where you have two HDMI outs. And there's a special one called main camera direct, which, or actually it's whatever your first input is direct. And it's like a pass through mode. So it's most useful for, uh, if you're plugging in a computer into input one, you can output the computer feed out the HDMI port, not processed. So if your, for example, computer is 60 frames a second, but your ATEM is set to 30 for streaming, the output will be 60 and uh, it'll be no delay. So that's useful if you want to like capture gaming, plug in your computer over in, in input one, and then see the output real time on a TV. Um, but th that, those are your output settings there. Um, we talked about the live stream section. We talked about recording. Um, again, the ISO recording is uh, only on the ISO model, but that gives you four files on, on the drive, one for each input plus your program feed. Um, and then let's move on to audio, which is, I think is the last big section. Um, but any other chats before we get into Fairlight? Target format was developed by True Vision for their video boards, supports 32-bit True Color, 24-bit plus an alpha, typically uses True Color format. Cool. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Okay, now we're moving on to Fairlight. So, um, Moving on to audio, which is the last main section for this overview. I probably should have started with audio, to be honest. So, oh, Graham, thank you for the super chats. <laughs> Thanks for all the info. The pup shots in an hour, so I'll have to pop out soon. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, cheers. Uh, I guess it is getting pretty late over there. And yes, see you on Sunday, and thank you for joining. Okay. The um, audio. Every uh, most of these buttons are actually for audio controls. Interestingly, so every input of your four HDMI supports audio channels, and there's two additional audio channels uh, as well, which are the two analog inputs. Um, right now, I've got audio from some of the built-in the camera built-in camera mics, and I've got one the Hollyland wireless transmitter plugged in, uh, which uh, is over here. And um, that is going into that into that mic. So let's take a look at the audio features in the app because most of the things are you're going to do are in the app, not on the device. I guess while we have this angle on the screen, the very quick overview of the audio buttons are you can turn on and off each source. So you can actually have all audio on if you want, which probably sounds like a disaster. Um, the, there is a little volume up and volume down button, but I don't find it very useful because you don't get any really indicator of what the volume is set to. If you look really close on the multi view, um, there is a, uh, it's very small bottom right corner of the grid. There's a little audio bars here. I'll turn on this camera and then there's a number down there. It says plus zero. And if you adjust, if you press the volume down button, you can see it's going or I'm going up apparently press the volume down. It's going to make it quieter and it jumps looks like three decibels every time. It's so small on this screen. I can't really see it though. Um, reset will jump back to zero. 
I don't find that very useful except for, again, like emergency settings where I'm like, oh crap, that is just like way overblown. So I'm going to just quickly drop it down some decibels until I can go figure it out. Most of the time I'm going to be adjusting audio in the software control app though. So the software control app has a whole tab over here called audio. And this is where you can do some really, really cool stuff. So let's first turn that off. Um, let's figure out how to get, I want to get the audio on the stream so you can actually hear it so we can hear what we're doing as we're affecting it. This looks like it's way, way too loud from this microphone. So I'm going to turn this mic down first. There we go. Let's drop that down three. I'll wear this really quick. And then I'm going to, oh, ow, jumped out of my hands. And then I'm going to wear my headphones. And we're going to switch the audio that you're hearing to be from this ATEM. So I'm going to turn that mic on and then switch my main ATEM audio. And, ooh, that's a lot of background hiss. Is that this mic? It is. Ooh, that's a lot of noise. Is that coming from this microphone? That doesn't sound right. Audio. Maybe it needs to be louder. No, I just can't hear it. I don't know where all that noise is coming from. Well, um, that's not good. Hold on. Uh, I don't know why that one is so noisy. Let's try this one. So that's plugged in, that's charged. And now let's go back to that audio. Okay, it's still pretty noisy. I don't remember the ATEM audio being this noisy. What's going on? Is my gain set too high? So it's, um, it's just, there's just a lot of background hiss. Maybe you can't hear it on certain speakers, but I can just hear a, uh, quite a lot of, of, of hissing noise. And if I turn the mic off, it goes away. So, um, is that, oh, one thing I can try on the road is it's set to negative 24 right now. So let's switch this over to line level. I'm going to boost the road volume. Is this better? Is this better? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Nope. It's too quiet. So we just have to leave that down at like negative 30. I guess this is the noise in the preamps, which is why I'm, uh, my normal audio, you're hearing me at line level, uh, which I think is, is the best solution is to set it to line level and use something with line output, not mic output. But we're going to, we're going to move on and keep talking about this because we can make this sound a little bit better, even with this, um, little bit of, little bit of hiss that we've got going on. So that was too much. Let me go back. Okay, so I've got the road set to negative 27 dB, and I can see that the levels bouncing here are heading right where I want, which is around negative 10. Um, so first of all, the audio uh, on-off buttons are also available on this screen, so I can turn on audio from other sources. This is from the overhead camera, so this is actually the audio from that camera up there. 
So that sounds terrible because it's the built-in mic. This is the this is the audio from this side camera, which is I think turned down a bunch, so you can't really hear me. Uh, so what that's mostly better. What I think what I would mostly use this for is um, adding in like music to the show. So if I take my um, iPod and where did it go? Take my iPod, connect it into the second second input. Um, there we go. And then on the iPod, I can now just go into like the music app and play some tunes. So the iPod's just playing songs now, and in the computer we can see um, uh, microphone two. Yeah, oh, it's clipping. So we have to go here, set it to line level, and there we go, and we got some music coming in. And now I can bring that on the air. So let's go and bring it on. There we go. And that's way too loud, so I can just bring this down with the volume. And now we've got some background music for the, for the stream. So that's the main fader. Um, you've also got panning, so if you wanted to move the music to one channel or the other. Oh, apparently I've only got one. Oh, I'm only listening to one, one ear. <laughs> I was like, why can't I hear it when I move it to the right? Because I only have one ear of the headphone on. Um, and then uh, you can also adjust the gain of the mic up here, which I don't need to do because it's um, fine, but you can hear that's going to boost the, the background hiss as well. So we'll set that to zero. This is also where you get to set delays. Depending on the HDMI camera you're using, you may need to adjust for the audio, for the HDMI delay in the camera. If you're bringing in your audio from a separate mic than the one that's in the camera, you might need to adjust it. You probably need to adjust it. This camera, HDMI delay is very, very low. It's basically non-existent. It's the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. However, um, I need to reassign my input to show you this. It should be, no, it should be that one switch to that one. Yes, so now in the ATEM, if I um, show you, if I show you the program from the ATEM, this is the program feed from the ATEM, and uh, you can hear the audio from this microphone and the music, and it looks out of sync now because this camera has a much worse HDMI delay compared to the Blackmagic camera. If you look at the two cameras side by side, you see how they're totally different delays. So um, it also means in practice I should not show this camera and that camera on the screen at the same time like I'm doing right now. But if I want to sync my audio to this camera, I can adjust for the delay by uh, setting a frame delay here. So the frame delay in the software control lets you add up to eight frames. The trick I like to use for knowing how many frames is appropriate because it's really hard to tell when you're just looking. Um, I like to turn on the built-in audio from the camera. So that is camera three. So this is the built-in mic from the side camera and here we'll go back to the program. So this should be totally in sync because this is the camera's built-in microphone. It sounds like crap but it's in sync. I can now turn on, on my microphone, microphone and you're, and you're hearing, hearing double. double. You're, you're hearing, hearing the, the delay, delay between, between of, of, of that camera's, camera's HDMI. HDMI. So, so the, trick, the trick, let me explain this without doubled up audio. The trick is I like to do a clap test and adjust the frame delay as I'm clapping. So I don't need to show you this anymore. I can show you, um, I can show you, uh, I want to show you, yeah, so you're hearing the ATEM audio, and now you can see my screen. So I'm going to turn on the camera from the 
the mic from the camera and leave this on. And I'm gonna do a clap test and adjust the frames until they come in sync. So you so hear, you two, hear claps. two claps. Let's try it with, with one. one. Closer. Closer. Two. two. Get, Get in, in there. there. Three. Three. So close. Four. Pretty good. Might be as good as we can get. Five. Oh. Yeah, I only hear one. Um, the other one was the reverb for in the room. So um, you're still hearing both of my microphones, but you're not hearing me double anymore. It's now extremely distracting for me to listen to because I'm hearing myself on a five frame delay. But let me turn off the camera microphone. Um, also, I'm probably delayed from this video now. So let me go back to the ATEM. I should be in sync with this video now because this is the very delayed camera. I'm now, I've got this microphone on a five frame delay and I should now be in sync here. So that's the trick I like to use, which is, um, which is the clap test where you have both microphones on at the same time. And that way you can hear the delay instead of having to just try to match it with lips. Okay, now I'm going to get rid of the delay because I wanna switch back to that camera so I can hear myself again. So, the, I wonder how long explaining the EQ and dynamics will take. That's what we're gonna do next. Um, oh, before that, there was a question about the delay. Can you change the delay with a companion button to sync different angles? Kind of. Um, I don't think there's a companion action directly for changing the delay, but we can check really quick. Um, the way I'm gonna check is just make a new button and then see if there's, so Fairlight is the name for all of their audio stuff, but let's say uh, set input mix option, no. Um, is it set fader gain? Nope. Is it, or oh, that was adjust fader gain. Is there a set? Nope. I don't think there's an option in companion, but what you can do is you can record a macro. Oh, we didn't cut about macro, not talk about macros yet. Um, so what you can do is record a macro, which let's find a free slot, call it set mic one delay five, record a macro, go in here, change it to five, stop recording, go here and say set mic one delay zero, record, and Great, now let's test those by running. It changed to five, it changed to zero. But you can hear why this is not necessarily a good solution. You hear that little gap? Here, I'll, I'll talk the whole time while I change the delay. So the, we're at delay five, I'm gonna talk, yeah, so it cuts it off for a split second as it adjusts. So. You can use it in an emergency, but I wouldn't recommend it for doing quick cuts between cameras. Really just try to use cameras that have the same HDMI delay all between themselves, um, or position your cameras so that the delay is not visible. So if I'm filming like a, an event at a, on a stage, if you have a super wide shot of the whole stage and the crowd, and the person on screen is like this big and their lips are like two pixels tall, you're not gonna notice if their lips are out of sync. So I like to sync the audio to the close-up shot and then just let the wide angles be out of sync and it's fine. Good question though.
Okay. So back in the audio, uh, that was a delay. I do want to talk quickly about equalizer and dynamics. Um, equalizer lets you adjust the EQ of the, of the sound, which is why I'm still wearing the headphones so I can hear this. So I can actually in here adjust how this, how this audio actually sounds. So I can take down some of the harsh mids. Um, if I want to try to get rid of that hiss that I can hear, I might try taking off some of the high frequencies and it'll adjust my, my speech as well a little bit, but this, I can hear a lot less of that high hissing noise now. So that's, I'll pr that's probably pretty good. And I can do the same with the bottom. I can clip some of the, um, clip some of the, the low tones that aren't part of my speech. And that way, if I do things like pound on the table, it doesn't rumble as much. Um, and then you've got the other mid, you've got three or four mid bands you can use. So um, I'm not going to explain everything about all of the features in here because most of it is like, go learn about EQ mixing from people who actually explain audio things. Um, I will plug Curtis Judd's channel though, because he's great at explaining this stuff. Um, and his channel talks a lot about all things audio, but he also has actually an ATEM video going into detail about all these settings. So um, definitely worth checking out this video. I should just drop this one in the chat because this is the video that you should go watch for sure. Um, so here, this is Curtis Judd's ATEM mini audio video. Also, this is going to save me a little bit of time on this video. So what I will mention, though, is that it is worth playing with the EQ in here to try to get your voice to sound better or and hopefully not worse. So now I sound like I'm coming out of a loudspeaker. Uh, one of the tricks I do like to do is if you know that you're in a um, like a room that has a certain tone or if you are dealing with someone's voice who um, you want to reduce some of the harshness, um, what you can do is you can go to the extreme of amplifying a particular frequency and find out where it sounds the worst. So like this is where my voice is kind of screeching. And now that I've found that it sounds bad, I can take that frequency and make it a slight dip. And that should smooth it out a little bit. And then I might try, um, I might try boosting something in the, in the lows to kind of give me a little bit more richness down there as well, which should, um, if I go too much, you'll start hearing the room reverb. So again, this is like where my room is starting to, to, to echo. So I probably don't want to am amplify that one too much. Um, but I might bump up like, um, around, oh, that's a little tinny. Maybe down, maybe down here. I'll give me, give myself some more bassy, bassy voice. So um, that's with the equalizer on, and then let's turn this off to hear the difference. This is the flat sound, which if you're listening to it on headphones, you can probably tell the difference. You may not be able to, listen, to hear the difference if you're listening to it just from like a phone or a laptop speaker. This is no EQ, and this is with the EQ, which I think sounds a little bit better, but it's always hard to tell when you're listening to yourself, because um, I'm also hearing my own voice in my head, like resonating in my head. So. The real way to do this is to play yourself back on a recording and adjust uh, when you're not speaking live. So we'll leave that there. And now let's talk about dynamics, which are some other really, really useful tools. And I mainly use this when there's uh, for like noise reduction. So again, I can hear a little faint background hiss that's sort of always present. And I would like to not hear that if I'm not talking. And that's what you can use the expander of the compressor for. So we'll turn these on and it looks like I've got some reasonable defaults in here already because I had been, have used this before, but uh, let's start with the expander. What this does is it picks a threshold, which is indicated by this vertical line. You can change the threshold and then everything below that is going to um, be adjusted by a different amount according to the slope of this line. So See this ratio changes that, or no, the range changes the slope. So uh, there's actually two parts of this line. There's 
ratio, which is there's there's or sorry, three parts of the line. There's the part above the line, there's this middle segment, and there's this part below. So this is a graph of input to output. So if I'm making a noise that falls at here, it's going to adjust it to here. So the reason that this sounds really weird right now is because it's not set right. And you're only really hearing the normal volume when I'm actually talking loudly. This is telling you what it's doing. So as I'm not talking, it's going to go down. And if I make noise, it'll be clamping down less. That's a bit extreme. Um, I usually have it something with a less of a oops, less of a steep slope, and then more just like a gradual tapering down. So you can kind of see that line is like a flat line now. What this does though is um, when I'm not talking, it's going to reduce the gain, which reduces that noise. So now, even though there is a background hiss, if I'm not talking, I can't hear it because it reduces the gain. Um, you can also adjust like how quickly you want it to recover from those. So attack is how quickly it will or slow it will react to changes in the volume. That's so this is way too high. So it's bringing the volume back up too slow. So I probably want that way down there. So it's quick to respond when I'm talking. And then release is the opposite. So that's how long should it, uh, how, how slowly should it uh, reduce the gain after I stop talking? So if I, if I make a noise, you heard the clap and then it slowly brought the gain back down. You probably heard some of the background hiss there. Um, we can clap test with the attack set to like 100. You may not even hear this clap now. Barely heard it. It was a pretty loud clap. Uh, but you can see that it was slowly bringing the volume up, um, not quick enough to, so the speech sounds weird. So I just usually leave these at their defaults. Um, so that's the expander, which is how you can reduce some of the quiet noises to make them even quieter. And the compressor kind of is for the other end, where if you are louder than a certain amount, it will reduce it. So you get a second line, a blue line, and anything um, above that threshold will then be reduced according to this ratio. So a very aggressive expander has a flat line here. Basically, it means that anytime I'm over a certain volume, it's going to flatten it. So let's turn off the expander and reduce this. And now you can see what's happening is I can basically never get louder than 15 decibels. See how this is just capping me here? I can't get louder than that because the, the compressor is flattening it. So that's too much. But what I do like to do is usually leave it somewhere around like that kind of a slope and with the expander on and with the compressor on, then you can use the makeup gain to bring this back up so that you are near the top right corner. And then you get a reasonable, oh, this releases too. There we go. So. This does a reasonable job of when I'm not talking, you hear no noise. And when I am talking, you're hearing a nice solid volume. It's, it's uh, letting me boost the gain of everything overall, but not then clip because it's reducing the most loud of my volume. Um, and then limiter is just like a hard cap. See that other blue line? Um, it's a hard cap on there and it'll let me if I really want to flatten out the, the levels, but it's like a sort of emergency break, where it sets a hard, a hard limit of that. Um, and that's the dynamics. Hopefully I did an okay job of explaining that. Um, I did not explain any of the underlying theory behind any of that, but that's how I use it for adjusting my audio. And yes, Curtis has a specific video about, uh, about more of the actual mechanics of what's going on in all of those. All right. Anything else on the fair? Oh, yes, audio follows video. So uh, there's another button over next to each of these cameras, which is, oh, Michael, thank you for the super chat. Um, I appreciate the super chat. Thanks so much for this in-depth in -depth dive into the ATEM. Really awesome and comprehensive. It is. I am trying to be comprehensive in this video. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. 
Um, so speaking of, audio follows video is the last one I want to talk about here, which is um, this other button on the on the ATEM itself. It's one of the ones up here, and it is um, in the software control interface. If you turn that on, what that does is basically it will switch to the HDMI audio based on what cameras are on the screen. So if you had two cameras and two different people looking at two different people and two a mic on each of them going into each camera, you could switch mics based on who's talking. I don't really use it for that, mostly because I don't shoot uh, scenes of multiple people very often. Um, but I have used it for like uh, going between a, a, uh, a video playback and myself, and so you want the audio to match, to switch over to the video playout, and then cut back to your voice. Um, and, but yeah, I don't actually use it very often. I normally control all my audio manually or through scripted actions in Companion. But if you turn those on, then whatever camera is on the screen will enable that microphone. Um, you can see the little on-air light because camera one is on the air right now. And if I switch to camera three, then that turned off. So that's audio follows video. Um, the opposite, video follows audio, does not exist in the ATEM, but it does exist in the Mix Effect app, which is another very, very, very cool feature of Mix Effect. Um, I did a demo of that already on my channel on Adam's interview. Um, let me pull up that link. This was a live demo of video follows audio. I'm not going to go through and recreate it all here because it's too much, but um, do go take a look. This is um, VFA or Video Follows Audio Live Demo. And um, in that video, we, I, I did have it running the whole time, but we showed how it works. Basically what it does is based on whose audio is louder, like which input's audio is louder, you can have it cut cameras. So you can use that for a multi-person interview really effectively where it's all auto-controlled. So you can say um, you can say you want the, uh, you, have, you have a close-up of each person in the wide shot, and then if nobody's talking, it cuts to the wide shot. If one person is talking, it'll auto-switch to that camera. It's really cool. Um, that's done in the Mix Effect app, though, not in, any, not in the ATEM itself. Um, all right, I think that's, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, I'm wiped. This is a lot. Um, we did not get through every single feature in the software control. I'm just looking through the ones that we missed. Um, we did talk about the media pool, talk about the audio tab. I'm not even going to go anywhere near the camera tab right now. I do have a Blackmagic camera. I don't really use this. Um, this controls only Blackmagic cameras. You can do things like color grading. Um, I should switch back to my other microphone. Um, you can do things like color grading. You can do uh, exposure adjustments of your Blackmagic cameras. I'm not going to go into all that right now, um, mostly because I don't really use it much, and uh, I'm sure other people have done better explanations of it. Um, and then what else is in here? I do use the capture still button. Whatever's on your program, you can just hit capture still, and it will grab a frame and save it into your media pool, which is actually really useful for um, if I have a layout created of like a picture in picture or a super source, you can grab it and then bring it into Photoshop to create graphics to put over it. I use it for that. Or for creating thumbnails, if you want to like pose for a YouTube thumbnail and capture it there. Um, and then the uh, what size iPad would you use with Mix Effect? The um, I've been using the, the iPad Mini most of the time. I think um, I think the Mini is a good b balance between the the size and the um, the phone is too small. The phone interface from Mix Effect is is really small. Um, I think the iPad mini is a good, a reasonable size buttons. The, uh, Jason, thank you. Thank you so much information to take in. Yeah, there's a lot here. I will be adding timestamps to everything so you can skip around later. Um, but hopefully you got something out of it live if you watched live. And, um, oh, Andre's reminding me, don't forget the headphone jack. 
Yes. Okay. That is the last thing I will mention here. The ATEM Mini Pro and the ISO, the small versions, do not have headphone output. There are two audio inputs, no headphone output. The way to monitor audio from this is use an external monitor that has a headphone jack. This is one of those, for example, Feel World T7. I did put the link below. And there is a headphone jack on this. So you can plug in headphones and then you can listen to what the ATEM is outputting on its program from a monitor. So you will probably want to find a monitor that has a headphone jack because not all monitors do. And um, that is uh, a big limit of the original of the this size. The ATEM Mini Extreme does have a headphone jack built in, which is a welcome addition. But again, it hasn't been that much that limiting to me because I usually use it with a monitor with headphones anyway. Um, great. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, good job. Go grab some refreshments. You deserve it. I will be grabbing lots of refreshments. That is the plan. Um, thanks everybody who joined live. Um, if you do have a specific question about something I did not cover in this video, we are, uh, we are very far into the stream. I don't even know how many hours we've been going. Um, three and a half hours and, um, did not get to every feature. So if you have a feature that you are you are have a question about, leave a note in the comments down below, and I will see about doing a video on those specific things later. Otherwise, um, I hope this was a good refresher for uh, those who have been using ATEM for a while, or if you're new to ATEMs, hopefully this has been a good overview for for you as well. Um, we did not make it to five hours. Nope. Um, three and a half hours is pretty good. I think I'm about done. I uh, also, I haven't eaten lunch yet and I just blew right past right through lunchtime. So, yep. All right. Um, thanks to everybody for joining live. Thanks for all the super chats. I'm going to go and, um, go get myself some, uh, liquids and refreshments and maybe some food. Um, this has been fun taking off tomorrow. I will be, I will not be doing a stream tomorrow. Uh, but we will be back on Sunday for a regular Q&A on Sunday. So bring your questions for that. And Monday, we'll be talking more about video switchers. We're going to talk about some of the similar uh, ones to the original A10 Mini without the streaming encoders. And on Tuesday, it'll be whatever, because um, Tuesday will be a birthday stream. It is my and John's birthday. and. We'll see if we can uh, have a good time and just chat about whatever on the stream. And I'll be breaking up the sparkly jacket. So you won't want to miss it. All right. Thanks, everybody. And um, oh, I saw it was somebody else's birthday today. Who was that? It was it was it was one of the Chris's. I'm pretty sure should shout out to uh, shout out to. Yeah, it was Chris. Shout out to Chris for uh, joining on his birthday, so uh, another December birthday. One of the worst months, I think, to have a birthday. But anyway, we'll have some fun on Tuesday. All right. Bye, everybody.